about uh, another minute till five, so we're just going to give a little bit more time just in case anybody else wants to join us, and then we'll get going. All right, I'm showing it's 5 o'clock. Let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, we're going to start. I'm going to ask everybody in the chambers to please join me and rise in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone had a wonderful Halloween and uh, got all of their trick-or-treating in before today. I know that uh, my candy stash grew overnight. And by mine, I mean my wife's, um, for which I sneak candy consistently. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, get into our business. We do have a very busy schedule tonight, so we're going to try to move things along. A couple of things at the top of the order. I'm going to ask everybody, please mute your cell phones. Please keep the talk inside the chambers to a minimum. Um, if you do need to have a conversation, please feel free to step outside. We will let you back in. I can pretty much guarantee that. Um, if you do need to take a call, please do so outside of the chambers as well. So with that, we are going to ask that the roll be called so we can determine quorum. <clears throat> Ms. Lyons? Here. <clears throat> Mr. Marcus? Present. Mr. Carney? Present. Mr. Parker? I heard you, but your mic is not on, Mr. Thank you. Don't mind, please. Move the mic. Move the mic. That's better. Mr. Rosa? Mrs. Present. Zara? Present. Oh, sorry, Mr. Rosa. Okay. No, no, no. I think that was uh, that was Dave trying to. That was Dave. Okay. Me. Okay, Mrs. Zara? Mr. Chavon? Present. And Chair Blank? Present. You have a corn. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks uh, for being here and helping us out. <clears throat> All right, that'll bring us to the first item that we're going to need to address. That is the approval of the minutes from our October 4th, 2021 meeting. I trust that everybody on the board had a chance to review those. Uh, unless there are any uh, addendums, amendments, or modifications, I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Mr. Carney. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Marcus. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, those minutes will be adopted. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to have our public sign-in, uh, or excuse me, public swearing-in. Uh, if you are a member of the public or an applicant or a representative or agent of an applicant or interested person who will be addressing the board this evening, uh, present in the chambers, I'm going to ask you to please uh, stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in by the city attorney. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have anybody online who is going to be addressing the board this evening? Not at this time. Okay, great. If anybody pops in, of course, we will uh, take that appropriately. Um, throughout tonight's meeting, we are going to have members of the public and agents and applicants addressing the board. I'm going to ask you when you step over to that lectern over there uh, to address the board and take your time. Please make sure to speak directly into the microphone. Uh, make sure to state your name, give us your address or whom you're representing, uh, and then you will have a set amount of time to address the board. That time will vary depending on your position or the item in which we're addressing, and we'll make sure to let you know what that time frame is ahead of time. No surprises here. We like to make sure everybody's aware of what's going on. Uh, but please do speak into the microphone uh, and, and uh, you know, keep, your, keep your comments as best you can directed to the issue at hand. All right, so that's going to bring us to the first item on our agenda, item 4A. It's currently docketed as the consideration to initiate a historic landmark designation application for Times Square Plaza. I know that we do have some uh, persons here uh, who are interested in that. However, I want to bring to the board's attention, it came to my attention shortly before tonight's meeting, that uh, the way that we place this on the agenda might be better addressed in a different fashion. This is not a singular piece of property. 
this actually consists of multiple units that have different owners. And so it, um, instead of being uh, designated potentially as a historic landmark itself, it might need to be a series of designations or even possibly a historic district. So what, what I would propose would be to entertain a motion to remove the item from the agenda this evening so we can have a conversation later about the best way to present it uh, and then potentially docket it on our agenda either next month or the month after. Mr. Chair? Yeah, please, Mr. Marcus. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you a little bit. I don't know if it's on, but. Um, I would respectfully object to your proposal because the shopping center was built as a single entity. It may be different owners, but it still functions as one architectural entity. And I think it would be better served to consider the whole thing. You can't consider one store at a time. It just wouldn't make sense. Hmm. I, that's why I would disagree with you. Understood, Mr. Marcus. Let me just check. Ms. Lines, were you able to hear Ms. Marcus? Uh, Mr. Marcus? Yes, okay, I was. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that, that you were able to hear us. Um, hey, Richard. That's okay. Uh, for the record, Mr. Rosa just joined us, um, and he's going to be sitting at the at the front um, at the front table there. Uh, okay, so that's Mr. Marks's position. I don't know if anybody else on the board has any thoughts on that. Well, yes. could you just repeat for Mr. Rosa's uh, benefit yeah. of how you opened the meeting so he can hear what you had to say? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, Richard, what what I found out shortly before the meeting is that the Times Square Plaza is actually owned by multiple unit owners, um, and so I thought it might be better to address it. Um, in the future, because I think that either it's going to take a series of potential landmark designation applications, one for each owner or each unit applied, or possibly consideration as a district if we were going to move forward in that direction. So I'm not sure that the way that we're, I don't know that we're necessarily ready for that conversation this evening. So my thought was to entertain a motion to remove it from the agenda tonight. We could have a conversation as to how we want to place it on the agenda in the future, possibly bring it back next month or the month after, uh, if we still wanted to move forward at that point. But that was my thought based on the new information that I learned today. Can I add for Richard's benefit? Yeah. Just R Richard, what I said previously, not to bore everybody for re repetition, but I respectfully disagree with the chairman's opinion because the center was built as one entity. It functions as a shopping center, even though the different parcels may be owned. And I think it would be detrimental to uh, to uh, looking at this to, to separate one store here and two stores here because it was designed. It's not architecture; it's urban design, and it needs to be looked at differently. That's all. So I don't know if anybody else on the board has any thoughts on that. Um, I do. It. Yeah, please, Mr. Chavon. I I do not agree with going forward with it tonight. And my reason is similar to yours, but not the same. Although uh, our fellow board member uh, suggests that it all comes under one umbrella in design, it's still 16 pieces of property that need to be discussed. And there's a lot of representation from each one of those owners. That is time consuming. It deserves a tremendous amount of attention to make a, a fair and just decision. And I just don't feel that we can do that in the amount of time that we typically have here. I like the idea of postponing it. I think we need to be better prepared, more information to ownership, possibly a workshop, but this is a not a small can of worms. This is a big can of worms, and, and that's why I'm in, in favor of looking at it a little closer. There are other things that I don't even want to discuss now that uh, I had conversation with, uh, some of the, uh, not the owners, but some of the representation. But I just feel like it's it's way too much on our plate right now, quite frankly. I don't understand. Why is it too much on our plate? I mean, it never has been before. Well, I, as long as I've been here, I haven't had 16 pieces of property, although you describe it as one. I'm looking at it from a different perspective. I don't think you can, my belief as an architect. Make sure to speak into your microphone, Mr. Marcus. Just make sure to speak into your microphone for me. Okay? Oh. Should be. I, I said my belief as an architect is you really can't separate it. It would be detrimental to the whole process. Understood, and that is a debate. That's one of many. So in my opinion, that's my humble opinion, and I'll leave it to the chair to see how we move forward with this. So I think to the extent, I mean, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on, on this, whether or not we should move forward. I, 
I would agree with Mr. Chavon, and I would agree with you. From the standpoint, when I was reviewing the minutes from last month, um, one point in, hi in highlight there was the time to obtain, I'm going to call it rebuttal material, but I'm, you know, a response from an app. It's not an applicant. It's a respondent in this case in order to not only provide the time in order to achieve adequate time to respond, but also to get a full breadth of what we, I think, would be wanting to see as a board. And I don't think looking at it at one as one piece would would necessarily be in the best interests of all the applicants. Yeah, I think, and I, one thing I want to note and make really clear is the only item tonight on, or excuse me, the only item on tonight's agenda is a procedural matter as to whether or not this board is voting to institute an application process for designation. So, you know, to, to that extent, I don't think we're too worried about, you know, quote unquote rebuttal information right now because that would come really more once, if and or once an application were completed um, with the staff report. But I, I just think that this, I'm not sure that we approached this in placing it on the agenda from the right perspective. I'm not saying it shouldn't be on the agenda in the future or shouldn't be still considered, but I just, and I and, and Arthur, I understand your position that it's it should be treated all as one. It may be so, but I want to make sure that we are, if moving forward, to approve or, or institute an application that we are instituting really the proper application, right? Dave. Well, I mean, oh, wait, sorry, hang, sorry. Hang on Chairman, I'm uh, on the fence. I'd like to have it, you know, addressed as soon as possible, but I'm in agreement. I don't know where we've had enough time to really study this and I think I think the most appropriate way to look at this and I maybe others may not want to I think we need to have almost a special session or a special opportunity to do this so that we do it right and appropriately but I don't want to keep pushing it off also Mr. Chair yes Mr. Just two, two comments one I don't think you ever asked if any of the board members had spoken to any owners or any representatives. You're correct. I did not ask for disclosures because I don't think that we're at that point yet. Uh, this is in quasi-judicial, so, you know, right. either way. Okay. Yeah. But you said you had two points. I'll remember it. When okay, we no problem. Whenever you do, just let me know, okay? Um, so, I mean, based on the conversation, and, and I want to be clear that my, my comments and position is not that I don't believe that this property deserves future consideration for the possible initiation of a historic designation of some sort. I just want to make sure that we're going about it the right way. And I'm not sure that tonight we necessarily are ready to do that. Uh, Mr. Chavon. I'd like to echo what you just said, but I'd also like to echo what David said. I don't want to see this thing pushed back. Right. I think this is a great opportunity for us to examine procedural, how things are done, um, what this board should be doing, shouldn't be doing, what, what our parameters are to readdress them. But I also think it's an opportunity for us to re establish uh, a, a, a relationship with future property owners so that we, as Arthur and I have been going back and forth on, educate, conversate, work with each other, and give information back and forth so everybody's on the same page before they get the letter in the mail, period. So in, so in regards to this property, I'll, I'll again uh, bring to the board's attention, I would entertain a motion to remove the item from tonight's agenda. We could place it for discussion on the For the Good of the City portion either later this evening or even in next month uh, to have a conversation about how to, how to move forward. I agree. I don't think we should let this languish. And I want to be very clear to the board, my personal intention would be for this specific property to come back before us for this purpose. I just want to make sure we're going about it the right way. Um, so I'd entertain a motion if one were to be made. And Mr. Chair, I just answered about remembered my second question. Please. Sorry. No, it's fine. Which was... I'm just curious how many board members are familiar with the Times Square Shopping Center or even visited it. And I think that to some extent, that's that's one of the reasons that we're finding some of these issues, right? I mean, I, but we don't know. Well, exactly. And again, this is a procedural vote tonight. Uh, it's on the agenda for a procedural vote, and and I don't believe my position is that it's best suited tonight. So, if there were a motion to be made, I would entertain it at this time. Did you say you were making a motion, sir? I can't make the motion as oh. chair, but I'll certainly entertain so, one if you have one. I, I will make the motion to table this to a f future meeting uh, for more discussion. So you're moving to remove it from the agenda this evening? Is that what you mean, Mr. I, I would ask for a specific meeting, like the next meeting. I mean, a future meeting is a little vague when we're concerned about the timing. 
And I think that to the extent that we can maybe streamline the procedure and not have to make that a subsequent motion to place it on an agenda, um, friendly amendment offered, which I think I could do as chair, uh, would be to uh, have the motion remove the item from tonight's agenda, placed on the agenda next meeting during the for the good of the city section so that we can discuss how to place it on the agenda for the December meeting. Um, and I think that might be a good timeline. Does that, Mr. Well, Sharon, does that kind of? I'm, I'm confused then. You? Arthur had a question. I'm confused. It's uh, already on the agenda. Why would we push it back for, to go to the city again? Because it's currently on the agenda for one historic landmark designation application, and right. I'm not sure that we wouldn't need either more than one or to have the application be designated as a district. So I think we something? need clarification on that, but that's the discussion that we as a board need to have. And that's what I want to place on next month's agenda, that discussion, so that we can then figure out the best way to go forward and then have it on December's agenda, actually, okay. for the, the procedural vote. Well, then that would be my intent if Mr. Okay. Chabon is, well, is on board with that. The, the, I'm going to draw this out a little further because it could, it could have gone on for hours, but in the interest of less than that, what are we doing? Um, I agree we should, we should take this off the agenda for tonight. But to just move it forward to the next one without a without a part of the motion having some sort of uh, plan, whether it's a workshop or a special meeting that David suggested, um, I just don't want to be back in this spot 30 days from now. And between now and then, no conversations have been had, no discussion has been had, and uh, the Sunshine Law disallows us from having these conversations. and. We are potentially the applicant. So this is kind of like a rock and a hard spot for me. Uh, it was another subject that I'll probably be asking Sherry about in the future. But I just feel like we're in a tough spot here. And what we need to do is talk to the people. Uh, in this case, we have a, a lot of questions need to be asked. Well, I think a lot of those questions that, that you're, you're alluding to or implying about, um, really would go to the substance of the application were this property to be found to potentially qualify by the staff report. Again, the only issue that's currently before the board is that is one which is procedural, whether or okay. not to institute the application process. Okay. So then my then my 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 uh, motion is to uh, remove it from the agenda for tonight and move it to the next meeting. Okay. So in that motion being made by Mr. Chavon, is there a second to his motion? I'll second it. Seconded by Mr. Rosa. Okay. Does everybody understand the motion? I want to make sure that we're all clear. The motion is to remove the item from tonight's agenda, place it on next month's agenda, and between now and then, what we need to do, though, Tim, is we need to specify, I guess, uh, what exactly or how it would be placed on the agenda for next time. So maybe it, it would be best, uh, it would behoove us then to have that conversation at the end of tonight's meeting during the further good of the city so that we make sure it's docketed properly. Um, and then that way we can, we make sure that we don't essentially go through the same process next Where time. I could uh, modify my motion to say that it would be moved to the next meeting to put under the uh, good of the city discussion next month. You could do that as well, whichever you'd prefer and or whatever we discuss at the end of this meeting. <laughs> I have a clarification. I'm just curious in the audience how many people are here for the Times Square tonight that would come back again. Because yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know that answer. Um, know. I'm not sure it would be appropriate for us to pull the room. I know that there are at least a few representatives here on behalf of at least one of the properties, one of the 10 or 12 properties, I think, in the in the unit, are in, in the, in the uh, property. Um, you know, I think that at the end of the day, the, getting the procedure right is uh, respectfully more important than the inconvenience. And that's just, we find that in courts all the time, right? We want to make sure we do things right one way or the other. So, Mr. Rosa, do you accept Mr. Chavon's amendment to his motion as a seconder? Can you repeat it? Tim uh, moved to remove it from tonight's agenda and place it on next month's agenda in the for the good of the city for discussion as to how to place it on the agenda of the future or possibly the end of tonight's meeting, uh, time permitting. Uh, well done, Chair. Thank so you. When, when, when would this then go back on the agenda, the January meeting? Potentially, it would then be in the January meeting uh, for consideration of the procedural vote. That's correct. Can we put that as part of the motion? Would you accept that friendly uh, amendment? I 
Well, that would be predetermined the unknown. I, I'd say oh, we're, we're we, getting there. We have to talk about it, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest doing that okay. at this point. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm in a position to make a motion that would determine when. So I'll remain my motion as it was uh, repeated by our chair. So that would just be to, to place it on the for the good of the city next month for consideration and discussion uh, as to how, if at all, to potentially place it on the agenda for consideration of the institution of an application, whatever that may look like based on our conversation. All right, everybody understand the motion? Okay. I, I would second. All right, so you'll accept the, the amended second. Thank you so much, Mr. Rosa. All right, let's go ahead and do a voice, a voice vote uh, on this one. All those in favor of the motion to remove the item from tonight's agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. All right, I'm going to find that the motion carries. So the item uh, agenda, item 4.A, will be removed. Thank you to those who came to join us this evening. We will see you in the future, I'm sure. All right, uh, so that'll bring us to the next item on our agenda, item 4.B, consideration to initiate a historic landmark designation application for Castro Convertibles uh, under case number UDP HPD 21003. Again, I remind the board that this is in fact a procedural vote. This is not a determination uh, of the landmark, of any landmark designation, but it's simply uh, our procedural motion to ask Trish to institute the application procedure um, by way of the the non-quasi-judicial nature of this, I am prepared to allow uh, the owner of the property or their agent five minutes to address the board, and then any member of the public who wishes to be heard two minutes thereafter. Um, do we have the owner of the property or their agent present for this piece, for this item? Do we have anybody online who's trying to be heard or who signed up? I don't believe so. I'll, I'll double check. All right. Uh, in the meantime, or after you're done double-checking, Trish, uh, if you want to go ahead and give us your staff report on this. Really, I, I mean, you'll see, uh, well, yeah, you can go ahead and give a staff report on this. Okay. Um, to the extent that there is one. Yeah. There's not much of a staff report for this, these items. Uh, the staff report did outline the procedure in which uh, the board asked for this item to be placed on this agenda. Um, from its last meeting, and now it's up for consideration to initiate a historic designation application as requested with the opportunity for um, the property owner to come before the board to uh, provide any, um, any remarks prior to proceeding with that. And we did send a mail notice to um, this property owner and did include a list of the historic preservation incentives that we do have within the city so that they could read through them. And now um, the board can discuss this possibility and um, proceed with a vote. So thank you so much. So notice having been sent to the owner and them having not being present or having any agent here, we're still going to go forward with this procedural vote. Again, the procedural vote uh, would be on a motion that was placed on this agenda based on conversation of the board at our last meeting uh, to have Trish Institute or begin the process of uh, the application to have this property designated or this, this building designated as a historic um, landmark within the city boundaries. Um, so to the extent that a motion needs to be made, I would certainly entertain one, unless there's other discussion. However, before we begin, I am going to go through to see if there are any disclosures at this time um, pertaining to this matter. So let's start with Mr. Rosa. Any disclosures on this property? None. Mr. Parker? Any disclosures? None. Thank you. Mr. Marcus? I have no disclosures, but I have a question. You never asked for disclosures <coughs> on the first project. Because we weren't getting to the to the procedural motion. But I still think it's important. Okay, I uh, understand. This sir. isn't quasi-judicial, but if you wish to voluntarily make disclosures, go ahead. Yeah. Not quasi-judicial. So um, I have none on this property, Mr. Carney? Nothing to disclose. Mr. Chavon? None to disclose. Ms. Lyons? None to disclose. Thank you so much. All right. So with that, um, are there any motions? To institute. Did you um, want to open it up to I the public? I have a public? question for staff. Oh, you're you're right, Shari. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Hang on two seconds, Mr. Marcus. Hold that thought for me. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? Please go ahead and uh, head on over to the lectern to our right. To Mr. Rose's left. Oh, there you go. 
And when you get up to the microphone, if you could please state your name, give us your address, and then you will have two minutes to address the board. Oh, that microphone's not on. Is there a button on that microphone by any chance? Oh, we've got our, our super IT tech guy going to come uh, give you a hand. Hang on two seconds. Testing, testing. There we go. Go um, give, us your, give us your name and your address, if you could. My please. name is Abby Lachlan, and I live at 1050 Seminole Drive, Fort Lauderdale. Thank you so much. You'll mm -hmm. have two minutes to address the board. Well, I don't know how this came down to me, but um, you know, for those of you who know me or those who don't, I am a huge mid-century modern enthusiast. Um, why else would I subject myself to this meeting if I didn't love these buildings? Um, but I do feel differently about all, all three of these properties, and I, I, I thank you very much for taking that, that first one off, because it was, uh, I think that was a, more than meets the eye. Um, but, well, I'll just, I'll, I guess I'll just talk about the Castro building right, right now. I mean, I don't, I don't think I need to tell you much about the architect himself, Charles McCarahan. I mean, he was most prominent and prolific architect in Fort Lauderdale in the 20th century. And I'm not one to propose suggestions or put together thoughts. I realize this is not a quasi-judicial hearing, but I just want to open the idea of people thinking about repurposing that building in a way that um, preserves the owner's property rights. And the way to do that is the city needs to, if it's available for sale, to buy that building and repurpose it as a park and community space. Now you may say, why would you want to do that on Federal Highway? Well, as you see Federal Highway getting denser and denser and denser, and it will continue to go because that's what growth is, and growth is a good thing, but that space is going to become very, very important to that corridor. And just like Flagler Village has their one stop, I mean, this certainly could be as important a green space and repurposed building for, for this corridor as any place else. So that's my thoughts on this wonderful building. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, like, on the button. Two minutes on the button. Wonderful job. Thank you so much. Any other members of the public wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none in chambers, do we have anybody online who wishes to be heard? We did not have anyone signed oh. up to speak online. Okay, great. Um, then what I am going to do is uh, close public comment on this item. And I'm going to ask the board if they have any comments. And we're going to, much like we did uh, last time, I'm going to kind of just go down the row, uh, down the line here. I think it's uh, it just, that worked out pretty well and pretty efficiently. So we're going to go that way. Mr. Parker, any comments or concerns or questions about this item that's on our agenda? No. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Mr. Marcus. I have a short statement I'd like to read, which I didn't do for the first project because we got Go for it. onto a different uh, conversation. I think it's important that we in Fort Lauderdale live amidst a world-class collection of mid-century architecture, which today is under a real threat of demolition and or desecration and in need of further pr 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 protections. These three notable mid-century landmarks proposed today for historic designation are all outstanding examples of the work of the architect Charles McKeerahan, who may likely be the most important architect you have never heard of before. He, uh, he was a 100-person firm in Fort Lauderdale in the 50s with an international practice. His firm designed hundreds of buildings around the city, uh, including most of Coral Ridge and the Mai Kai restaurant. Most importantly, Charles McKeerahan was honored, was what is honored today in the world of architecture as being a form giver. He brought new architectural design innovations to post-war architecture in Fort Lauderdale that has li literally uh, given us our identity as a, a post-war community. Historic designation will not prohibit a property owner from developing the rest of the property although the new structures need to be respectful of the historic one. Buildings around the world, as Abby said, are being repurposed for all types of different uses. This is how historic properties can remain relevant as a city around it changes. 
In a letter recently sent to the Historic Board by Robert and Gwen McKeerahan, the last living child and son of Charles McKeerahan, he says that architectural conservation is about enriching the future with the best of our past and co can go hand in hand with new development. I urge you and I urge the board to take a look at this and um, approve these buildings to go further in the process for historic designation. I, I believe that we need to carefully consider what's before us because we're really voting for the preservation of the soul of our community. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Appreciate your comments. One more comment. Oh, yeah, please. On, on the um, Castro Convertible Building, I have a question for Tricia. Um, I've noticed in the historic pictures that the original glass-fronted retail store was the original building on site. It looks like the rest of it was were later additions. So I'm wondering how much could really be or would want to be designated. I haven't fully evaluated this property for its architectural integrity, okay. but visually from the street side, it appears mostly intact. But in, in early pictures, there was only the glass part. So I'm just as you go through the process. Correct. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Mr. Rosa next. Mr. Rosa, any comments, questions, concerns? At this point? Uh, just a couple of comments. You know, and to, to pick right up where Tr Trisha left off, um, without a real significant architectural evaluation of where this lands today versus where it was where it was designed, yeah, I'm sort of looking at things um, in front of me that are available. I'm just going to Broward County Property Appraiser. I noted this property, um, not that it's relevant to exactly what we're discussing, but sold. It sold this year um, in 2021. It sold in, in, so I have a hard time understanding that we noticed the owner, and I'm not discounting that we did, but that no response or, or an agent response was not had. That's interesting. Um, aside from that, you know, there would really have to be something very compelling for me to look at this through the lens of, of something significant enough, um, given its location. I just looked at the historic resource map all, as well. It's interesting. Nothing really north of Sunrise in this corridor has been as, I would have thought at one point, something here. As far as the Bonnet House, that's kind of as north as it gets. And then after that, nothing's really there yet. So I think we're really trending in an interesting direction by looking at this um, and looking at this zone specifically. But, you know, I really I really would feel much better about all of it if, if we could compel the owner, even see if we can get a second notice out to see what their response would be here. I just feel like it's a, it's a very large piece of property. Um, it, it fronts a significant portion of Federal Highway. I, I agree to some to some extent of looking at it if the city would be interested in taking a look at it to preserve it. But to look at it and, and to put forth an application for it without even hearing from the owner, I, I struggle with that. Um, I, I just struggle with that idea. Um, but those are my comments. You know, I think I, I think that's where maybe I land where I'm pretty firm on that point. You know, if, if, if the applicant was here and certainly part of the discussion, then it's more of a collaboration at that point to, to think about ways we could implement um, the existing structure with, with ways that I would presume are going to be obviously development um, actions in the future. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question for Richard. Sure. Sorry to interrupt so much. How do we move forward if we can't let the historic preservation staff do a report so we know more about the property, so we can have an intelligent discussion. Yeah, and that's and that's just to follow up on that with Marcus. That was kind of my um, with Mr. Marcus. Excuse me. That was that was kind of my thought in response. I was going to save it till till the end when I commented, but I think that and I I think that, that second noticing to the owner because I'm actually surprised they're not here as well. Um, but I think that second noticing would come if in fact an application were instituted, then Fair once enough. that application came before our board, they'd get noticed, we have the full conversation, we have the background right. information. Again, this being a procedural vote, so that I think we can get a lot of that information that we as board members are in order to make the ultimate decision. Sure. You know, so again, this is the, the first step to us gathering. Sure. That, right? And I think that that's something. No, it's, 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 uh, it's, we don't frequently sit in this procedural stance, so it's hard for me to shake that, but I, I, I agree with what you said there, yeah. that, it's, that, it's, that, that is the next logical step. But taking the step further past that is where I pause, and that's and that's something that I think we we no. we all kind of individually have to feel out once we get that information back, right? Because I'm not, I, you know, one thing I found personally, and I'm sorry, Mr. Carney, Mr. Chavon, and Ms. Lyons, I'm going to get to you y'all in just a minute. One of the things that I struggled with going through this was removing myself from that perspective, Mr. Rosa, of how do I feel about this ultimately, and having to say, okay, wait a minute, that's not where we're at right now. 
Like, I don't know yet. And having to kind of pull myself back because I found myself sitting on that fence a little differently for the various positions. So I think sure. that we need to caution. We need to be cautious not to get there yet. We're not even starting there, right? We are taking a procedural vote as to whether or not even to have Trish do the research so that we can get the information. I think it's the title of the agenda item that sort of just jumps me to that next step is when you, you know, you have it set forth as a consideration to initiate the application itself. I guess in, 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 in context, it's to do a report, right? It's to get that understanding in more detail. So with that, I'm good. I think it's just jumping off that topic that sure. caught me. And Chair, if I could add, yes, please. Uh, if a motion is indeed made tonight to initiate an application, the property owner is noticed again within 10 days of this motion. There you go. So they, they're going to be part of that conversation with Trish, just like any other time. Good, that there's anything like that there. good to know. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, all right, so I'll jump to um, Mr. Carney. And then Ms. Lyons, I'm going to put you at the end if that's all right. So I'm going to go okay. Mr. Carney, Mr. Chavone, and then you. Nothing to comment on right now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chavone, anything? I yeah. thought Ms. Lyons was ahead of me. I'm going to go to you first, and then oh. I'm going to go to Ms. Lyons. Um, tough spot. What uh, the public had to say, Ms. Uh, Abby, uh, and what uh, Arthur is suggesting, you know, are new, fresh ideas. Uh, that Abby brings to the table. She thinks we have a nice piece of property that the city should buy and make a park out of it. I entertain that type of thinking for the future, that there will be funding so that we can have some sort of a way to take to make historic preservation possible, some funding there. Um, I understand what Arthur's saying, and I like the, the fact that he's open to the repurposing of buildings and uh, usage of the properties to grow and stay current with what's happening in today's market. Um, but if this all still comes back to communication besides both between both property owners and government, so that they know that these options are available and they don't freak and run out the door like somebody's coming in to take their beloved child. <laughs> so uh, my question too, I have a couple of concerns. The notification to owner uh, Trish, if I could ask you, please, is that a certified letter? Certified uh, mail? The the letter that went out for this meeting was not certified. Okay, so um, so the argument the could be made by the owner. I never got I never got anything. It got lost in the mail. That was voluntary notice that was provided. The notice that we have in our code is a notice that we give after the application is initiated, not before. Okay. That was a voluntary notice that we issued. So so the certified letter goes out after the application comes in? If the application started. After the application. If okay. you vote tonight to initiate the application, then a letter would go out within 10 days. And that would be within 10 days of, of the application being initiated? Of today. Of today's vote. Of today's vote. And that would give them whatever time they get that letter to whatever time it goes before the commission or comes back here, what, 30 days, 60 days? It would go before the board first, and then it would go to the commission afterwards. So I'm just curious. Could you tell me what kind of time frame is? Trish, how long do you have to complete the application? There's no definite timeline, but the property owner would be noticed again at least 30 days in advance of when it would come back to the Historic Preservation Board. So they would get noticed 10 days after today's vote if we have one. Okay. And then once Trish finishes the application process, all of her research and review, before at least 30 days before it comes before us, whenever that may be, whether it's two, three, seven months down the road, mm -hmm. 30 days prior to that. So it could be as fast as 30 days. It could be as long as six months. I think it would have to be probably as fast as 60 days because I don't think yeah. the 10-day notice and then the 30-day okay. notice. All right. I'm just verifying that. Well, there is a... There's a time limit in accordance with the statute that basically says that once Trish determines that the application is complete, then we have 180 days for it to be approved or denied at the commission level. Like so it time. expires in 180 days if nobody takes a look at it. So After it's Trish is done, yeah. After Trish is done. Right. Okay. Um, procedure. I'll touch on a hot spot. And this is for Ms. Sherry, please. I'm having a bit of conflict in trying to understand how it is appropriate or there's not a conflict of interest for our board, the Historic Preservation Board, to be the judge and the jury, the applicant for a piece of property. And it's got nothing to do with these properties and 
the issues that have come forth. It's just that here we are, when they redesigned this application process, I think it was last year or the year before, and uh, redescribed who could apply. Uh, it was uh, taken off the table that just any John Doe could come up and put a, an application and it had to be this the commission, the owner, or a five-year uh, nonprofit historic established uh, group and or the historic preservation board. Now here we are the board and we're also the applicant. Now in the past I can remember certain board members had to excuse themselves from voting because they were either on a, a neighborhood board or they had some connection to the property that was being considered. So for me, I have a conflict here at thinking that when this board comes as a group and votes in favor to put an application in, if I'm not in that thinking, I almost feel like this board has predetermined its position before it even comes before it and we put that other hat on. So I, I feel like we're kind of like one of them little Mayberry courts where, you know, the judge puts on his judge hat, then he takes that hat off and he puts on the sheriff hat and then he's the mailman and then he's the applicant. And, uh, you know, I, no disrespect. I just think the process is flawed and it was overlooked and I, and I think it should be considered. So I see that you spoke with Mr. Shine earlier today because I actually spoke with him as well and he brought up a very similar, uh, similar perspective. And the, the point that I think is missing is that this procedural vote tonight is not one of a fact-finding mission, which would make us a jury to determine the facts. We, our role as a jury doesn't come into play until that staff report comes before us and we get to review all those factors. The procedural vote is not one which places us in a position of saying, we are for or against designation yet. We are saying, Trish, go get us the information so we can make that decision. Because Trish might come back to us and say, I did all the research, I did the background. It does not satisfy any of the subsections that would qualify it as a historic landmark. And what we've seen, of course, in the past when other people apply is Trish comes back with a staff report and says, does not meet criteria, does not meet, you know, does not qualify. I mean, we have that tonight in some of our reports that we're going to hear later. So I, I, I understand the... Um, the perspective, however, I think that it is misguided because we are not stepping into those roles which you you are uh, are concerned that we are in. We're not there yet. Were we the ones doing the research? Or, for instance, Mr. Sharon, if you were the one to say, I'm going to go pull out these news articles, I'm going to go get the, his the history of this property, I'm going to bring it up, and you know, I'll get it to us next meeting, then you would be the fact finder. Right? then you would be in that role. But because we are simply taking a procedural vote to say, Trish, we are directing you to go get to do the research, I don't think we're there yet. Well, we're there yet. I'll offer this. Yeah. That, that's up for debate, and I would debate that uh, spiritedly with you. <laughs> However, uh, can, can we, have we can't talk me, about Can we have Shari answer your question, though? Go ahead, the city attorney. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, Sherry. Okay, uh, so yes, um, essentially, I agree with the chair, Chair Blank. Um, as, what you're voting for tonight is just procedural. You're actually just voting to whether or not Trish is going to initiate the application, and she's going to gather the information and then present it to the board. The applicant is actually the city. Uh, your job is merely to do a motion, but the applicant would be the city of Fort Lauderdale. That is the applicant, and so you're not the applicant and the the fact finder and the jury all at the same time. The applicant is the city of Fort Lauderdale. There is no entity called the Historic Preservation Board. The entity is the city of Fort Lauderdale. And so you would listen to the evidence at that hearing and then make your determination at that hearing. The purpose of this hearing is not to hear evidence and weigh the evidence like you would in a quasi-judicial hearing. That's not occurring at this hearing. It's merely for you to decide whether or not you'd like the city to initiate an application going forward. And then at that point, the, the uh, staff report can either say that they uh, recommend or, or state that it meets the criteria or it doesn't as we have the staff reports before us tonight. So with each criteria that we have, I believe it's A through H and 472411C, uh, we have... Um, criteria written there that Tricia will evaluate and make that determination and give you a recommendation. And then the board will make that um, decision at, at, at the point that they will read the staff report and then evaluate what they hear at the hearing, what you hear at the hearing. I, I still am a little confused in that the Historic Preservation Board is specifically mentioned as a group slash party 
that can apply for historic designation? No, you're not the applicant. The city of Fort Lauderdale will be the applicant on that application. Okay. The city, the, uh, the, we changed it actually. We changed the code from anyone who lives in the city of Fort Lauderdale being able to apply for designation on someone's property to changing it to these, these entities, the, well, not these entities, but these groups here, the city commission uh, initiating the application or the, the board or a nonprofit and, um, or the property owner. But that's how we changed the code. Okay, so I still feel like we're splitting hairs in a way. It's very close in, in definition. Um, I don't know if anybody's been on a little league team and one kid's father is the coach and sounds like he's in every game. Uh, there's some favoritism being played here, and I just don't think it's uh, – I don't know if I could use the right word and say it ethically correct, but it certainly has the perception that the fix might be in, and that's why I brought it up. So I will I will let it rest at that. I don't understand what you're talking about. Arthur, our board is putting an application in or in part of the process to initiate an application. Right. If we didn't do that, no one would ever say we had anything to do with it getting started. If we do do it, they say our responsibility is to review the information after it comes in through an application. And that could come in through the other four channels. It doesn't have to come in through ours. That's my point. I'm, I would respectfully I disagree. bore everybody with this. But. I believe that we need to understand what this board can do. And is, is okay, very good. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I certainly take exception to the to the the the, the commentary, and I don't believe that it was uh, meant ill. That that there's some sort of um, unethical or improper. I wasn't implying that there is. I was saying that perception could be there. Sure. No, no, no. And, and, and that's why I didn't, let me be clear, I didn't think that you were saying that. My concern. I hear a lot of stuff at my bar. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. You know and it's <laughs> but, not all good. <laughs> um, I probably said some of it at your bar at some point in time. <laughs> Does that, I've lived down here long enough now. But I, I think that uh, we need to be very cautious about, about commentary like that because what we are doing in considering a potential motion to initiate the application is following part of what is allowed of this board by the code. And furthermore, I think it's important, and I agree with Mr. Marcus, and we recognize that as a board, we're not just here to uh, simply review the applications that come before us, but by way of our obligation of the, of the code is to assist in preserving the history of the city. And to the extent that that can be done by looking into whether or not a property is ripe for historic designation, I think that's appropriate. Um, there's a difference between us saying, we are applying for historic designation and us saying, Trish, look into something and see if it qualifies. I think there's a difference there. Uh, no, not I think there is. There is a difference there. And this procedural vote to ask Trish to do, uh, take the resources out of her office to do that uh, is fully appropriate and allowable under the code. And, and I do not believe there's an appearance of impropriety whatsoever in that regard. It's the chair's position. I'm glad we had this talk. As uh, these types of things need to be put on the table, and the public needs to know that because these are the questions that are posed to me. I, I this agree. Is, this is what I hear, and so this is why I bring it here because we can only talk about this 12 times a year. I know. And we can't talk about it otherwise. So, unfortunately, it takes up our time and energy, and that's what we live with. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I appreciate most about this board is. Uh, is our ability to have these conversations. And, Can you uh, speak louder, Jason? Honestly, yeah. I'm sorry, I said, uh, Ms. Lines, I said one of, the, one of the things I appreciate most about this board is our ability to have these conversations uh, and to discuss these matters publicly and respectfully with one another. Um, but in, in that regard and in that light, I want to make sure, Ms. Lines, that you have an opportunity to be heard. And I apologize, number one, to Ms. Wallen for stepping on her toes and responding directly to Mr. Chavon prior to you having a chance. That's just my lawyer's ego kicking in. And Ms. Lines, I apologize for making you wait so long. Please, any comments or questions or concerns that you have? Well, I'm not troubled by waiting at all. It's not a problem. Um, my concern was already voiced, and that is, how do we know the property owner received the notification and knowing that the next is going to be a certified letter um, answers that issue for me because then we're absolutely certain that the property owner got the notification. So I'm fine with this. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Lines, for your comments. Um, so with that, if, if there is a motion to in, uh, initiate the application process for this property, I would entertain it at this time. I move to move forward. Okay, so Ms. Lyons, having moved to initiate the 
uh, application process for this property on this item. I'm assuming, Mr. Marcus, I'll second it. you're going to change your secondary motion to a second. second. Uh, Mr. Marcus, having seconded, any discussion on the motion? All right, hearing none, let's go ahead to a voice vote. All those in favor of initiating a historic landmark designation application for the Castro Convertibles building, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Hearing none. Any abstentions? Carries unanimously. Thank you so much to the board uh, for that matter. Trish, you are hereby instructed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that'll bring us to the next item on our agenda. Let me scooch back up here on my computer, sorry. Uh, item number 4C, uh, consideration to initiate a historic landmark designation application for the Bayview Building, case number UDP HPD 21004. Uh, Trish, you want to go ahead and make any comment on the staff report leading into this? Sure. Uh, similar to the last item, let me just get the image up on the screen so you can see this building. Um, the staff report primarily just goes over the procedure of the matter and that this is on the board this is on the agenda at the board's request um, and asking for the board to make a recommendation of whether or not to initiate the application for the Bayview building that's located at 1040 Bayview Drive. Thank you so much. Okay, again, this is a procedural vote. Is there any uh, is the owner or a representative of the owner present? Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead and uh, approach the lectern if you could please state your name and put your uh, address or with with whom you're representing uh, and then you'll have five minutes to address the board absolutely i'll go as quick as i can good evening uh board members chair and board members my name is robert locker on behalf of the ownership i'm, I'm joined tonight by principals of the ownership jack abda seth wise and jeff lapidus are here as well um and my address is 1401 east broward boulevard um, our client did receive a letter um, from you all on october 12th um, and so we thank you for that notice and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. You know, one of the things that I think is unique, well, this is unique, right? This is the first time this board, you know, I've been practicing law for 28 years. I think it's the first time that the HPB, HPB board has begun this process. And I think one of the things that is important to recognize is, as your chair has said and as the city attorney has said, is this is not a quasi-judicial hearing. The criteria that you have is not before, that you usually have is not before you. Should you usually you look at an application, you go through each list, and you see where it fits that criteria. In this case, you have to make a decision whether from a policy perspective, it even makes sense for you all to begin this process. And we think there are unique facts on this case, which will lead you to conclusion that it really is not appropriate in this case on this property. Um, and that's a very important distinction because once that process starts, while I recognize it's procedural, but it begins to take a life of its own. Once an application is filed, certain things can and cannot happen, which is directly attributable and will de 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 uh, directly impact what is happening on this site, and I'll go through that. Um, but I think what's really important, I've got plenty of graphics I can go over, maybe in answers to questions, I don't want to use up my time, is this building has changed very significantly from the time that it was originally conceived and in a lot of the pictures that Arthur has shown you. By the way, although my client got notice of this October 12th, we went back to the record and we recognize you all have been talking about this a long time, so we're glad that we're invited to the party. Um, but since the time that, that those graphics were shown and the, and the original building has been designed, there's been major alterations. The porte which was such an important element every time this is presented, simply doesn't exist. The signage on one face of the building, which again has been highlighted over and over again, simply does not exist. Banding has been added to the overshell of the building, which other writers have written would need to be completely redone for this to continue with its historic nature. And probably most importantly, a floor was added to the top. So a lot of those clean lines and elements that made this building interesting, and hats off to Mr. Marcus for putting together this historic history of the site, which is part of the record of it, but a lot of that is simply gone. So these are the types of things you have to take into consideration, as well as the fact of what literally brings us here today. So as we all know, um, the city of Fort Lauderdale, along with every city in South Florida, is taking a very strict look at 50-year inspections. Um, after the events of June 24th, the tragedy in um, Surfside at the Champlain Tower, the city of Fort Lauderdale, and basically these owners and others, immediately went out and hired engineering consultants to take a look at the building. 
The first consultants began that process. While that was going on, we got a letter. So the first letter we got wasn't from you all. We got a letter from se on September 2nd that said we needed to, and we actually received it a few days later, that said we needed to do an engineering report and submit that to the city within 90 days, and then all repair work on the building has to be complete within 180 days. We followed up with emails explaining that we're going through the process and re received emails back from your building official that nothing else matters, that's what's paramount. So let's talk about where we are right now. Those initial reports indicate that the structural elements of the building, which are behind really the only thing that's left from the old building, which is the brick on the outside. And again, I do have photographs I can show you. Those exposed columns that hold up the building are in need of repair. They have significant damage. The report also said that the essentially the platform that those bricks land on, they're just an element, they're a decorative element outside of the building, that that element has spalling and also needs to be completely repaired. It then said, and probably most importantly, that we needed to go out and get a third party consultant to do an analysis and testing of the site itself. That study is underway now, but initial reports indicate that the columns, in order to save the building, that are behind that facade, again, I can physically show you what those look like, need to be completely rebuilt. That means you go into them, you break into them, you put more rebar in, and then you pour in place additional concrete. In addition, the, the shelf, essentially, that all that brick and concrete um, outside or realm sits on all needs to be repaired. Those elements have to begin immediately. However, that is probably the only thing remaining from this building that's interesting. So if you were to say that the building, and we think it's more of a nostalgia value at this point than true historic value, if those elements are to remain, we cannot complete the improvements that we need to do pursuant to our engineering reports and that the city of Fort Lauderdale is requiring us to do. We did send an email to the city building official, ask if we could get a deferral on that time period because this item was pending before HPB, and the answer was absolutely not. The HPB, all due respect guys, don't, over, don't overtake the Florida Building Code. By the way, those elements could not be replaced under the current Florida Building Code and meet Fl Florida current, uh, current Florida Building Code requirements. Last point I'm gonna make, once this application gets filed, according to your code, we no longer can submit permits to make the restoration that we're being required to do based on the recent events that have occurred in the last six months. So it does have an implication on us. I think you all can take all this into consideration as it relates to this specific site. And potentially, my suggestion would be say, say, you know, maybe this application's not for us. You're under no obligation to begin this process. Someone else can do that. Thank you, Thank Counselor. You. I, have a, I have a question. For you. We'll, we'll get there in a minute. I want to go ahead at this point and open it up to the public. Are there any other members, or excuse me, are there any members of the public uh, who wish to be heard at this time. Yes, please approach the uh, lectern. If you could once again, just uh, place your name and address on the record, uh, and then you will have two minutes to address the board. Yes, Abby Lachlan, 1050 Seminole Drive, Fort Lauderdale. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, again, I realize this is, you know, not a, a quasi-judicial <clears throat> hearing, um, but I, I just want to make sure that this building gets to have a conversation about what's going to happen in the future. I mean, I think that was the whole purpose of of, of of you bringing this, you know, to the board so that there'd be an opportunity to, to just have a conversation about the building before its, you know, its destiny and future is determined. I mean, it, it may be determined by a 50-year inspection. It, you know, may be determined by other issues, but I, I just think that this is the time to have a conversation. And you know, one of the conversations is again about property rights, and how can the developer be made whole if he decides to conserve this building in some way? I mean, I understand that most of it is, you know, not original, and there are additions in the top floor, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that something can't be done. Some type of conversation, some types of con conservation, and in 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 the end. 
it's really this, the city that can be the Supreme Court on deciding on whether or not this, you know, this, what the future of this building is going to be because the city has the power to do the upzoning that's needed, the parking reductions, you know, all the things that would have to be done to make an older building like this sitting in the middle of a valuable lot, you know, be, be worth it. I mean, you know, I live near the building and I'm, I'm here saying, you know, give them more zoning, give them extra zoning so that somehow this can be a, a collaborative project that somehow, you know, this can be a, a true partnership with the city that, that works for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Again, right on the nail on the head. That's good. Um, okay, any other members of the public that wish to be heard in the chambers? Let's see, none. Anybody online who's attempting to raise their hands and jump up and down saying, we want to talk to the HPB about this item? Uh, not at this time. No, nobody's that excited. Okay. Um, Ms. Lockery, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and uh, retake the uh, lectern if you could, because I have a feeling you're going to be fielding some questions from some of my board members I, I <coughs> as well. But we're once again going to start uh, from the far right of the dais over here. Mr. Parker, any comments or questions uh, for Mr. Lockery uh, at this point? Well, I think this is really the first door we're opening at mid-century buildings. Very few have we looked before this. And I was even going to comment when we get into some couple of things when are further in our agenda. And I think, again, we... We have a lot of education to do ourselves, and that's what is bothersome there. And I, when we dis discussed the previous one, I think we learned a lot just in that short 15-minute period. And I think we have to have an opportunity to get better educated ourselves. And of course, now if we have another objective on the table, and what the, how it would interfere with what could advance there, I think we have to look at that very, very seriously. So. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Mr. Marcus. Um, I have a few comments, and then I have a question for Mr. Lockery. Um, I agree with Mr. Parker that this is the time to have this discussion, as has been said. I mean, um, and I wanted to also uh, address something, Robert, you said that Arthur, 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 do me a favor. Just make sure to speak right oh. into the microphone. We want to make sure. Can, right. can you hear me now? Is that better? better. Yes. Oh, um, the possible replacement of historic elements is not set in stone. That's something on a case by case basis that would be determined by the board at some point in the future. So the fact that the signage, the big signage, is not there, that's a minor thing that could relatively be replaced. But the removal of a top floor is something I certainly wouldn't vote on, even if it wasn't wow. historic. Um, and the problems that you describe in the concrete and replacing the rebar are endemic in South Florida. I mean, I don't know when the last time this building even had an inspection, and you probably don't know either because it's new ownership, but I would tend to guess that like everything else in Florida, um, people assume that a 40-year inspection means you don't have to do anything for 40 years, unfortunately. Um, my, my one comment and I, that David said is I couldn't agree more that I think both the public and the board require more education, education, education. We don't know enough. And we've said this in different ways tonight. And I think somehow to at least get historic preservation staff to give us the information that we know what we're talking about. We're talking in the wind right now. And I will end with my one, my one question finally is. Um, Can you speak into the microphone, Mr. Marcos? Yes, you never describe what are the owner's intentions with the bill. Uh, I don't think your microphone. No, on. it's not on. Is it back on? Yes. All right. One thing I want to make very clear is since this property was purchased in 2014, the owner has had multiple discussions with city staff, with city officials, and with our neighbors about potential redevelopment on this site. So there is a investment-backed interest in the acquisition of this property and the future of the property. At the same time, there have not been any specific plans submitted to the city in this regard. 
What has happened is the need to get that 50-year inspection complete and the results of that 50-year inspection. So now we're caught in a situation where, while I understand it's just information that Trish will be providing, necessarily the way it's written now, unless there's a way around that, and, and to the chair, I'm all ears for that, necessarily that application is more than just information. It actually begins a process that puts us in an extremely difficult situation. Not only, can, not only, by the way, structure, but the entire electrical system of the of the, uh, it w which won't surprise you. So the entire air conditioning system. My question to you would be: So when, I mean, obviously we don't want to impede uh, this this kind of right. work, the structural work. When do you so uh, believe our that this would all happen? Because maybe we could take action after this is done. The obligation right now is that we prepare this and get the information to the city by December 1st, essentially, and then okay. complete the work within 180 so days. So if we were to meet in December and have the same discussion about possible historic designation, it would not impede anything on your property? I would, I, when I, I don't know what that, I don't know what changes between now and December. I could probably pro provide more evidence from my side, but again, I think what I keep coming back to is while I think this is an exercise that clearly your code provides, it doesn't provide any criteria which would require you to be this applicant on this case. Well, and I, I mean, I that's purely a policy decision. Understood. Just like the Broward Trust might say, you know what, we got to pick which ones we're going to go after. This is so important, we're going to dedicate our resources to that. I also think that's true with this HPB board as well, and the City Commission for that match. Thank you, Mr. Lockery. Mr. Marcus, anything else? I'm just saying I think part of the job of the HPB board is to do these things. And it may not have happened in Fort Lauderdale, but it's common throughout the rest of the country. Un understood, understood. And as I said, there's many cases that you, there's, a, there's a lot of McCarran buildings left in the city of Fort Lauderdale. So I do understand that. I do understand that. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Mr. Rosa. So the one one comment is... Um, Pitch to me favorite favor the one comment is based on what Mr. Lockery had raised regarding some of the changes that were already made to the property, and it, it really reverts back to staff. Uh, do we have a threshold percentage once the building has changed to a certain degree in which the historic value or the historic preservation of it has diminished to a degree in which we're no longer going to pick this building because there's been so many significant changes? And that's aside from the structural issues, because I think everyone agrees that it probably takes precedence over everything at this case, at this point. But is there a threshold? Because I'm looking at the Department of Interior standards, and there's certain things they go through. But Tricia, do you look at something to tell you whether something has been changed so substantially, not to use the word far gone, but that it's beyond designating? Um, there is not a percentage threshold, threshold per se, but there is an evaluation of the architectural integrity by using um, guidance that's found within the National Register bulletins. And that's looking at location and setting and design and craftsmanship. And sev there's seven different aspects that would be analyzed and looked at to see how much has changed over time. Is the original design intent there um, to, to kind of come to a conclusion of does the architectural integrity still exist? OK. And that has not been undertaken. No, I no, I, I understand that. I guess the pause I have is, is clearly if we do initiate the application in a formal sense beyond this procedural point, um, I, I don't know how we work around, call it the freeze or, or the stay of it being something from a Florida building code perspective where we're interfering then at that point. And that's extremely troubling to me because I think anyone who saw Surfside clearly understands the significance of of paying attention to and being extremely diligent about that at this point. Well, that's why we're going to have another discussion with the applicant. Right. It's appropriate for the timing. Right. And I think for me, having that, having having a better understanding, at least I'll go into a dive myself as to where, you're not talking about a threshold percentage, but maybe some better baseline of understanding at what point is it, is it past the historical significance? And I guess that's something we could do it, you know, individually. Is, I, I want to make sure. Just, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that we stay on, on point here with the conversation because I, I recognize your struggle, Mr. Rosa, especially in light of the information brought to us tonight on the structural deficiencies of the building, right? Sure. Now. But I want to make sure, again, we, 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 we focus our thinking and our comments to the fact of this procedural vote, right, as to whether or not to institute it. And again, much like with the prior 
like, sure. we were discussing. No, I get it. I think a lot of those concerns, a lot of those questions, a lot of that information that we that we are so used to kind of running back and forth on right. our mind has to do with the substantive nature of whether or not an application, if it is instituted, should be approved. And I want to make sure that we don't cross that threshold because we're not there yet. Um, but again, this is the... Now, with that being said, let me also say this. As this is not a quasi-judicial uh, postured motion, you know, as, as Mr. Lockery you know, keenly noted, really it's a policy decision as to whether or not this is a building that we want to institute an application. Sure. So you can consider things outside of the bounds of the code in making your decision of how to vote on the motion if one is made. But I think it is important that we don't lose sight of the issue at hand. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is before we're charging Trisha with the obligation to then present as she would devote all resources as she would any other applicant is a better baseline from where we're sitting. Because to ask that without a better understanding of the first point I made, it goes in circles. It really is a circular reasoning. And at it's this funny, point. Mr. Rosa, you bring that up because I thought about this. You know, it, it, this is a very item that I thought about coming into today's meeting. And I swear to the left side of me on the day it's enemies lines, I'm going to get to you. I promise I'm not going to keep you waiting all night. Um, you know, in law school, you learn about the definition of pornography, right? And the definition that the courts use in pornography is. Look, I don't know what is or what isn't pornography, but I know it when I see it. Sure. Right? And to, to me, the answer to that query is kind of, is this something that is still so significant that it that it is deserving of such an application process and potential consideration for designation? I think you know it if you see it. And that, that to me, is kind of the approach I'm taking. You know, we are certainly not the Supreme Court, for whoever mentioned that earlier. I don't remember who mentioned that. But, uh, you know, but to the extent that they gave us that little tidbit, you know, thank you. And. That's kind of how I'm approaching it. But let me, let me move on down. I'm sorry, Mr. Rosario. No, you you're fine. Nope. Okay. All set. Mr. Carney, anything? Uh, nothing to comment on that hasn't already been said. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chavone? How about we go to the young lady on... Ms. Lyons, Mr. Yeah. Chavone is deferring to you. Well, I want to establish the issue that Mr. Lockerty raised, and that is, can you clarify this, please? If we move forward on this, as we did on the property before this... Are you saying that your work in terms of doing whatever you have to do to the building comes to a halt? Well, I don't want to make that determination, but I'll tell you what the code says, because it's very clear. Um, the code says that once an application has been accepted, and, and th by that it means that Trish prepares an application, she files it with Trish, Trish reviews it and accepts it, or, or essentially, or doesn't accept it. So that will happen when she completes her study. I mean, she'll wear two different hats, but that's going to happen. It does not come back to this board. At that point, you can no longer pull a permit from the city for essentially renovation major work on the facade. What does that mean? What that means under the code, specifically the definition is anything that can be seen from a right-of-way. Trust me, the work that's going to be done will be seen from a right-of-way. So we will be prohibited by the city's own code for pulling a building permit to make the repairs we're required to make. And let me just show you real quickly why that matters on the building, since it does refer to on the right-of-way. If I can remember how to switch this, it'll come real quickly. Remember, the elements, uh, and I, I apologize, but I think some of these specifics are kind of important, just because I've... make this work oh no it's on here isn't it never mind sorry sorry everybody I'm he's more up to tech than I am here that's why he's here that's right we're up to all right let me get this stuff any of us <laughs> well now how do I go to the next there we go okay so these are the elements you see that the clean brick there the you know straight lines the porta cachet the sign etc porta cachet porta cachet and you see the lines how it's all clear but you see what the important point is that concrete structure um, the breeze work that's there so this is currently what's there again there's been a lot of different things added to it there's all kinds of other elements but the brick elements both the white and the red brick are what you see what you know what uh, I assume people are nostalgic for here's what that looks like inside behind that brick there are columns that the that the brick is attached to barely attached it's all well, it's all corroded and falling apart. So opposed from the, as a, in addition to the problem of the brick just falling and collapsing on itself, it's not a support structure. The columns themselves are in such a configuration with cracks as you can clearly see in these photographs that they need to be completely repaired. They need to be completely replaced. In order to do that, all that brick comes off. 
it necessarily has to come off in order to pour the new column. That's the only thing left. I mean, there may be other elements, maybe the shape of the building, but the real key elements that are what was in question, I would predict, you know, if the site, as the chair says, what you see, you know, if you see it, that's probably what's kind of cool about the building. And it's not gonna, it, it cannot, it necessarily has to come off to make these repairs if the building's to be saved. Understood. Thank you, sir. Could you clarify if this happens at the first stage when Trish is doing her research? <laughs> Or does it happen at the second stage after she's done her research and presents the information to us? Great when question. When does it hamper your ability to do the repairs? Great question. It happens when she's done with her work, but before it comes to you. So it happens instantaneously when she has completed her report and then she's accepted it on behalf of the city. That's when it occurs. That is a huge can of worms. And that's why I do think this is a different situation than what you all typically see. Thank you, Mr. Slocum. Ms. Uh, one moment, Ms. Marks, I'll come back to you, I promise. Ms. Lyons, anything further? Well, I think we're between a rock and a hard place. Hmm. Maybe a brick and a pillar. Or a brick and a, a, brick and a column. Yeah, right, could could a column. I just add to that, just <laughs> yeah. to read from the code of yes, that Wallen, particular please. section? So it's 472411C4D. So what it specifically states is from the date that notice is given after the city's receipt of a complete application in accordance with uh, section 4727.7 of the ULDR, no building permit for any um, new construction alteration, major, uh, major alteration, re relocation, or demolition that may affect the property proposed for designation shall be issued until one of the following occurs. The Historic Preservation Board finds that the property or properties do not appear to meet the criteria for designation and recommends denial of the application, uh, uh, requesting designation to the City Commission, or if 90 days from the date notices given have elapsed unless the time limit is waived on the record by motion of the Historic Preservation Board, stating mutual consent between the owners and the Historic Preservation Board, or the city commission finds that the property or properties do not appear to meet the criteria for designation and denies the request for designation. So it's not an unlimited time, but there's specific time periods in here. Thank you. Ms. Could I, could oh, sorry, you clarify, Mr. Lackerty, could you clarify how long the city has given you to make these repairs? Yes, the city gives us 90 days to submit the report. We did an uh, there was an initial report. There's now the additional third party report. Once that gets to su submitted to the city, we have 180 days. But that includes permitting, construction, and completion. I do so want you wouldn't, be pulling, you wouldn't be pulling anything for 180 days. You wouldn't be pulling permits for 180 days. No, the work we would. We would have to, in order to save the building, we would have to do the work. It would have to be completed within 180 days. So you we say have already order, notified all tenants on the site. Say, we you say in order to save the building, what do you mean? I mean, so, so in other words, in order to, in order, once this report comes out, and this will be happening, you know, this is the world we live in now, it's these structural reports. Once that report comes out, then we have to su submit permits and do all the construction within 180 days. Do you have concerns, and Ms. Lines, I'm sorry to cut in here, but Ms. Mr. Lockery, I just want to be very clear here based on your comments. Do you have concerns um, based on the expectations of that report as to the structural safety of the building? And I, I'm, not, I'm not asking to box you into a position that possibly could be um, troubling for, for your client, but is that a consideration and one of the reasons that you are you know, looking to move forward more. Yeah, more it is It is a consideration and we've notified, We've the owner has done their duty to their tenants to notify their tenants of that issue and they've asked for them to vacate the property. I would not say it's an immediate issue, but it's an issue. Yeah. A concern nonetheless. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Lines, anything further? Yeah, can we just, I don't, I hate to belabor this, but could we just establish a little timeline here? When is Mr. Lackerty going to submit this report? Well, when or... When, when, the, is, when does the clock start ticking? I think the clock's already ticking, if I understand him correctly. Yeah, the, the, the clock started ticking on September 2nd. So on September 2nd. And then what's the next deadline you have? December 2nd is the deadline by which the rep all the reports need to be submitted to the city's building official. Okay, by December 2nd. 
And if Trish was able to do the report for us uh, to present at our December 1st meeting, and we were able to assess the historical significance of the building, would that um, be within your time frame? Well, I, I guess where I'm heading is, let me, let's go through, the, yeah, it would be in this sense. If the board were to designate the property, well, first of all, we would already be, we would already been stopped from being able to move forward. Because Trish would have- Well, nobody's it. stopping you from moving forward right now, right? I mean, what would be stopped in terms of moving forward? Doing the repairs, right? Tri no, as soon as Trish prepares her report, you can no longer pull a permit on the property. It doesn't- But when would you be pulling permits on the property anyway? When would you be starting your work? Not till December 2nd, right? Correct. Well, then we have, I mean, Trish, is it feasible that you could get us this information for our next meeting? No, it's not. Then and, that I'm is very open. I'm suggesting okay. another issue. If it is designated historic, then we have even bigger problem. Understood. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll go ahead and go right. I want to be very transparent about that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Locker. Ms. Lines, anything further? No, I think, okay. yeah, go ahead. Thank Perfect. you. Mr. Chavon. Wow. Uh, Mr. Lockery. Sorry, get, you're going you're gonna to do a lot of getting up and sitting there. Okay. That's what um, <laughs> question. I need the exercise. The, whatever you do to this building to fix it structurally, uh, just so I understand clearly, there is a structural issue that has to be addressed with the 50-year inspection. That's not going away. Correct. That has to happen. Does that mean that the brick design, the red and the white, is going away? In order to make those repairs, our structural engineers are telling us it has to. And they explained it to me on the phone, and then a picture was a thousand words. I'm like, yeah, I get that. You got to take out the, the concrete, shore it up with additional rebar, and do a pour. So and right now, that brick is right up against it. In, in the makeover of your building after the structural work is done, have you guys looked down the road to say, hey, we're going to put it back the way it used to be, or you're going to come up with something new? We haven't looked that far down the road. Okay. What so, we do know is we can't put it back the way it looks today because yeah. it doesn't meet Florida. And even if you did, it wouldn't be the original That's uh, correct. work. That's but um, So going back to Ms. Lyon's question, timeline, Mr. Lockery, in and as far as a date goes, if all things move forward with the city and your reports, forget the HPB, if we weren't here talking about this and you comply with the city's needs, what day do you have to be done with your remodeling? Is that February, March, what St. Patrick's Day? There's a, there's a lot of options in that, in that process, but it, the date by which we have to you know, we would begin to get fined in addition, first of all, if December 2nd, but then it would be 180 days from December 2nd. Okay. So I guess, Arthur, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit, and I know you were passionate about this, um, but where I'm going with all this is, and, I, and to you, Mr. Chair, I know we're not supposed to think down the road, and we're only supposed to look at what's in front of us, but, but all things considered in the uniqueness of this circumstance and trying to not create more unnecessary work for our, our staff. Where, where can we be, where are we in the reality of, is this building not going to look the way it looks today, one way or the other, and therefore why should we be moving forward with this process? I, I have a lot of misunderstanding here. I'd like Mr. Lockery to clear up something because he first said that it is the date of the application. Robert, you said you first said that it was the date of the application that is so sacred in terms. To be fair, speak right into that mic. Oh, thank you. You had first said that it was the date of the application that is the sacred date that we cannot pass anything in the HPB. Or actually, you, what you said earlier was that Tricia could not complete the report. Since it's obviously going to take her two months or so right to complete the report, um, my question to you is, is, is it the date of the application? Because that's what you were originally said. And I have a few more questions. 
Okay, so let me try to break that apart. So the date by which you can no longer pull permits, interim protective measures, as Sherry read, from the date the notice is given after the city's receipt of a complete application, so the day we get a subsequent notification from you all, which is of a meeting, then we can no longer pull building permits. But, that's but let not me be my, very That's clear. not my question. Okay. My, my question was, is it the date, the date of the app, once the application your permit application is in. I understood from what you said previously that the HPB could act after that date. Well, but I don't want to be in a race with you guys. No, to I don't either, but I'm just trying to get ahead of the problem. Uh, no, I understand that, but I, we're not going to spend a lot of resources on this. If we, you know, We need to know where we're going. We've already approached the city and said, look, on November 1st, they're going to have a hearing. Can we get a stay? Can we get some additional time? And the message from the City of Fort Lauderdale building official was no, 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 no. no You're moving yeah. ahead or have to move. Structural. Ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm really concerned then because basically what you're saying is you're demolishing this very historic building. You're totally changing the outside of it to become something new. And I'm disappointed, again, as an architect, that you're not looking at some kind of lightweight, moldable plastic forms that would look like the brick but not be the brick. I mean, there are obviously ways to go here. Obviously, it's expensive, but this is, this is a notable building. And as something was said before, and I've always been in favor of, and I think this is a perfect property for it, I believe that part of any kind of negotiation with historic preservation or designation should include additional zoning height or massing for your property as a, to compensate for the historic designation. That's all. Yeah, it's not a question. <laughs> That's not a I question. I can answer it, but it's probably well. Weird. My question was: You're basically demolishing the building. I mean, it's you know, if those incentives were in place, and we still would be in the same situation with this building, though, unfortunately, even if there were incentives. What I'm not saying is there are other ways to look at it. There are other ways to look at it. Understood. All right. Thank you for your comments, and Mr. Lockery, thank you so much for entertaining all of the uh, all the questions and, and, and concerns of the board. Um, Yeah, Mr. Carney. Robert, um, you said you gave legal notice to the tenants to vacate. Uh, when is the deadline for the uh, entire building to be emptied out? Um, we're continuing to work with the tenants. Um, deadline was yesterday, um, but we're still working with those that are. How many tenants are still in the building right now? I believe there's one. Tenants. Uh, maybe five. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my whole concern just thinking about this is, is what if the safety inspector comes back and says this building's too far gone, it has to be demo de demolished. Mm -hmm. That is... They didn't say that. Not, you never know. I mean, I'm, or if it's red tagged where nothing can be done to it. That is, that's my main concern. Um, just from the uh, structural issues uh, Robert had ra has raised there. Uh, that kind of puts them, the owners, in a... I see. You know, rock and a hard spot, as uh, we already mentioned. Um, that's my main concern. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Ms. Lines. Um, how many tenants are there? Five. How many tenants are are left? Are you no. asking? How many tenants total? Oh. How many tenants are in the building? The answers. There were thirty-ish. Thirty tenants. Okay. We're down to three or five. Okay. Okay. So I think that, um, you know, I, I got to say, I applaud the board's um, efforts to take, you know, what, what are the initial steps in recognizing this mid-century architecture throughout our city. I agree, Mr. Parker, with your comment um, earlier. I think it's important that we recognize that uh, it is a, a, a large and important part of our city's history. Um, but I got to be honest, personally, the public policy considerations of the safety of this building are, in my opinion, over uh, overarching and overweighing on my uh, my decision making process here for this. And if this were a situation where um, the repairs might have been able to have been done without what, and I agree with Mr. Lockery, appears to be the sole remaining um, historical aspect of the building, right? The screen, the brick screening. Um, I'm sorry. Breeze block. Breeze block. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I learned so much since I joined this board. I got to tell you, I really, I learned so much. Uh, it, you know, if, if it were able to be done without the breeze block being 
essentially destroyed to enable that to be done. Um, I might be in a different posture, but personally, um, this might not be a fight that we want to take up here. This might not be something that we want to that we want to jump in. I think that the overarching uh, public policy concerns of safety are, are greatly outweighing uh, any concern of saving of this highly modified building, in my opinion. Um, but that's just my two cents. So, Chair, can yes. I interrupt? Um, there is a member of the public that has raised their hand virtually. Would you like to take their comments? Yes. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's bring them over, if we could, into the panel side. Thank you so much. Um, member of the public who wishes to be heard, we are going to allow you to uh, give us your comments. If you could please state your name and give us your address on the record, and then you'll have two minutes to address the board. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Thank you so much. Yes, this is Dennis Omer, 1007 Northwest 11th Place, Fort Lauderdale. I just wanted to say that um, Mr. Lockery is correct. I serve on the Board of Rules and Appeals for Broward County that administers the building code. Um, I'm only disclosing that so that you know that I have the knowledge. The building official has sole discretion over this building now. And he, if he says he's not going to issue any permits because of the condition of it and he wants it repaired, that's what's going to happen. There's nothing that can that that you know he will do to extend the time he has the sole authority so for you to go forward i think it's a mistake i'm a big historic preservationist i went on the tour a couple weeks ago i went to this building but in view of what mr lockery has said tonight i don't think you should go forward thank you thank you for your comments all right we're going to go ahead and close public comment at this point and um i have one comment mr. sure mr. mr marcus yeah um, I, I don't think any of us want to impede the structural work. I mean, that's not the purpose of the board. And certainly in light of Surfside, we certainly want this to proceed. But if you said that you have 180 days to get the permitting and complete the work, and you start at September 1st, so around March 1st, you'll be complete. Correct? No, my understanding is that it was 180 days from December. From December... I don't know. Second? So okay. it would essentially be by June would be the deadline for them to complete the work. We're hoping that they would do it beforehand so that it wasn't too late to do any work. Well, my my um, suggestion would be... Just get into that microphone. Schedule the, get into that microphone, Arthur. To, my, my suggestion would be to um, push this to June but still have it in the works not have Trisha finish anything because you said it was the completion of the report that would trigger anything. Well, here's what, here's what I'm going to suggest is I, I don't think that this would be ripe to remove from the agenda and, and continue on those grounds. But because it is a procedural vote, I do not believe that this board would be um, prohibited from reconsidering in the future if the posture changed to the building. We could certainly bring it back up in the future. Um, Ms. Wallen, am I correct in that? That's correct. You don't even have to move on anything tonight. You could just simply don't do anything and move on to the next item. And then when you feel like it, ask us to put it on the agenda in light of the fact that the building may look different. So I think that it's important though, um, I, I would I would say this much. I think it's important at this point since it is on the agenda and we have had such a lengthy discussion for us to take some action on the item, um, or at least for me to call for any action on the item if there were a member of the board that wished to move. But I think that, that is certainly an option for this board would be to take no action. Mr. So, Chair? Yes, Mr. Marcus. Just one comment. Do you realize, though, that in six months or so when the work is done, this historic building will have been destroyed? It, it may or may not have been. We don't know. But well, I we were just told. But based on your based on your proposal, that would ha that would have no effect. I mean, whether we, right. we re-agenda right. it six months from now or we just determine if we want to address it six months from now, that, that really is, is of no consequence. Um, all right, so then I, I think that it would it would behoove me, however, to call for a motion if there were one to be made. Question or clarification, please, yes. um, Sherry or Madam City Attorney. Uh, so, if I heard this correctly, six months from now, if we if we decide not to do anything tonight, we just go back to square one. We can that building can come back up again. Nothing stops us from going back to this, but we make no consideration. We don't have to make a determination tonight about six months from now. We we can make a determination tonight to say this goes away. So That's correct. You okay. could you in other words, if you do if there's a motion to initiate the application and it fails, there's nothing more for you to do. You just move on to the next okay. item. Okay. But Tim, I wanted to 
elaborate on that. You realize, as I said earlier, in six months, there will be no historic building to designate. That's, again, again, as repeat what our chair said, I understand that, and that's a possibility, but I, I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Chair, uh, all things considered, um, that I don't know what the right word I'm looking for is to uh, uh, not, I'm recommending we don't go for, forward with this uh, so let me, let procedure. Me yeah, let me recommend that the motion be made in the affirmative and that the actual motion be to initiate the landmark designation application and then should the motion fail by enough of, enough of the members voting no, then it would go away. But I think the motion needs to be worded in the affirmative. So, okay, so the motion would be to initiate the historic So we initiate it for a vote? It, it, would be, it would be a motion to initiate the historic landmark designation application, correct? And then vote no to achieve what you're trying to make a motion for. Right. Well, I'd do that if I thought everybody was going to vote no. <laughs> well, I would suggest a friendly, a friendly amendment. Okay. That I understand what you're saying. I think that's fine in light of what we've talked about. But I, would, I, I don't want to leave it in midair. I think it should come back at least for some review or discussion June 1st or something. Well, we can, when we, we get are. closer to that, when we get closer to that month, we can always have a discussion of what's on the agenda. Okay. Well, so maybe so, we can make a note to our staff to bring it back or suggest that. My motion will be to, uh, in light of the structural, uh, the priority of safety and structure, to vote on this, yes. but, but So the motion to, is to, to, vote to initiate the landmark designation application. Without any amendment. Got it. Is there a second to Mr. Chavon's motion? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Parker. All right. Uh, we've talked this one to death, uh, so let's go ahead and have a vote. So, uh, go ahead. Sorry, but I'm gonna, I'm let's gonna, specify yay and nay and what it means. I'm a step ahead of you, Tim. Okay, boss. A yes vote would be to direct Trish to begin the designation or the application process, uh, and that would have the consequences that we discussed with Mr. Lockery and, and the timeline issues and all that. A vote for no uh, would, or a no vote would be to not take any action on it at this time. We could always bring it up six months from now. Later, we can address it again. There's nothing prohibiting that. We're not stopped from doing that. Can, can I, I don't know, Tim, if you'd like to add that to your motion that we consider it again or we talk about or Trisha brings it back again in six months and we see, I think we should have at least have a progress report. I don't think we need to. To, to make that part of my motion because it can happen. It's it's just a question of it coming back up again. Well, I want to make sure it happens. I don't. I don't. But then you can bring it back up. I mean, okay. you can always bring it back up on the further good of the city when we get closer to that time frame, or or you can ask. Uh, you know, you can move at that time or May. You know, to place it on the agenda for the June for the June meeting certainly. Um, and I'm sure that we can all remind you when we get closer. Don't worry about it. But just to be okay. clear, no means no. <laughs> yay means yay. Okay. I will leave that alone. All right. So the motion having been made, is there any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we will have a uh, voice vote on this. All those in favor of directing Trish to institute an application on this item, please signify by saying yes or a. All those opposed, signify by saying no. No. All right. The motion fails. So there will be no action on that. Thank you very much, sir. All right, that'll bring us to our next item on the agenda, and this is a quasi-judicial matter. Uh, accordingly, let me get straight here. Um, we are going to go through our normal processes. Let's give a brief moment to allow the uh, the room to clear. Mr. Schein, good seeing you. All right. Um, let's see. Sorry, I need to readjust my agenda here. Okay. That'll bring us up to... Item 4.D, Certificate of Appropriateness for Demolition under case number UDP HP 21029, demolition of a single family residence found at 404, or I'm sorry, found at 404 Southwest 12th Avenue. Uh, the applicant is 404 Seminole LLC. Let's go ahead and do disclosures. We're going to start with Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker, any disclosures on this item? Mr. Parker? Dave? Dave? Which one are we on? I'm sorry. Uh, the one you want to talk about. Oh, yeah. I have... I was there today. Okay. Okay. Visited the site. Visit. No disclosures. None. Uh, no disclosures on my behalf, Mr. Carney. Nothing to disclose. Thank you, Mr. Chavon. Nothing to disclose. Ms. Lyons. Drive by. Drive by. Thank you, Mr. Rosa. Drive by. Drive by. Thank you so much. All right. Let's go ahead and hear the staff report. Okay. Good evening. Uh, this is our certificate of appropriateness for demolition for the demolition of a single-family residence in the Sailboat Bend Historic District. 
in the most recent architectural resource survey, this property was found to be contributing. Um, a little history on this structure is that it was, um, there was another structure on this parcel previously that was demolished in 1959. And the current structure that's there today was moved from another location at the corner of Southwest 15th Terrace and Broward Boulevard to this location in 1960. Um, the location where it came from, there's several other frame vernacular structures that are similar in appearance to this building. Um, so in the staff report on the second page, you can see photographs of the existing conditions of the, the property in question. And then on, also on the second page, there are some photographs of the, the structures that are located in the previous area of where it was moved from that are very similar in design and nature to this structure, just to show some comparison. So when reviewing a demolition application, we're looking at our general criteria for a certificate of appropriateness. In this um, situation, criteria, criterion A applies. It's the effect of the proposed work on the landmark of, or the property which such work is to be done. In this case, it is a contributing structure. So um, completely demolishing it would, would be a negative impact to the building. And then the other aspect to consider are the criteria for specifically a demolition request. Two of the three uh, criteria do not apply. The criterion that does apply is two, which is the property or building no longer has significance as a historic architectural or archeological landmark. Again, since this is a contributing building, it would negatively impact the property um, since it is considered to be significant to the the historic district. So in summary, in conclusion, in accordance with the ULDR, staff finds that the application for a certificate of appropriateness for demolition under case number UDP-HP21029 located at 404 Southwest 12th Avenue does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CI of the ULDR and does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D4 of the ULDR. If the application is to be approved, there are two conditions for the consideration of the Historic Preservation Board members. One is that the demolition of the structure should not uh, negatively impact the adjacent historic district and protection from construction debris and construction equi equipment shall be provided as necessary. And then two, that the application is subject to the approval by building zoning and all ULDR requirements. Thank you. All right. Is the applicant or the representative present? Okay. Applicant and owner. All right. Uh, if you all want to go ahead and approach um, the lectern, you'll have 15 minutes to address the board. You guys can split up that time if you'd like, or one of you can address the, uh, the board in its entirety. It's up to you. Just make sure if you could, please say your name and give us your address on the record prior to beginning. Hi, um, my name is uh, Alan Powell. I live at 100 Southeast 11th Avenue, Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. I am the applicant. Uh, the owner is uh, Mr. Cliff Berry. He's sitting right here. Um, we did not apply under section uh, 472411 D4 or D4II, as uh, Trish res responded in her comments here, because we didn't, that, that, designation was something you guys just recently put on this property uh, when you redid the uh, survey for the entire neighborhood. Uh, so we did not believe that this property ever had any historic significance. So by applying under that condition, it would have been saying that one time it had historic value and we don't believe it ever did, uh, number one. Number two, uh, the structure was when the the whole district was made originally a historic district, the original period of significance was 1913 to 1939, I believe. It was just recently in your new survey, you have brought that date further or more current into the, into the current realm. I don't know what actually date you cut it off on, but this property, when it was originally built and when it was relocated, was neither fell in that, time frame. The 
So as that was, as in that respect, we don't believe that this house should have been given a, a contributing value. Um, the original owner of the property, before it was ever relocated, obviously didn't believe it was significant either because he sold it off to have it moved off his property so he could redevelop his property without this house. Right? Then once this house was brought to its present location, the structure was modified so it fit onto a new foundation, and then an architecturally non-matching garage was added to the side of it. The garage was not part of the original house, and it doesn't really match the house. It somewhat matches the house, but they didn't, back in 1960, they didn't even use the same siding as the original house on the two pieces of property, or two parts of the building, so they don't match. And, you know, I believe, and so does Mr. Barry, that, you know, we're not trying to disrupt the neighborhood and the historic classification of the neighborhood. We believe that, you know, historic buildings of architectural significance should be maintained, but we don't believe this building ever had one. My fiance owns a house that was built in 1924. I live in a house that was built in 1936, neither of which we have ever any intention of demolishing or altering. We like both of them. So we don't believe that this house had any value originally architecturally. We believe the city in their survey might have made a mistake by making it a contributing property. We don't believe it should have been. Then she says that the, the, it's not applicable that the redevelopment of this is a benefit to the historic district. We don't agree with that. We think that a neighborhood, in order for a neighborhood to survive, it needs to thrive and have new people moving into the neighborhood. We're proposing taking this house down, replacing with three single family homes that meet the current zoning, that we're not trying to ask for a zoning change to increase the zoning to RM25, which surrounds three sides of this property. We're trying to put three single family homes on this and bring new families into the neighborhood to try to improve the neighborhood, not to try to change the neighborhood dramatically. And very few single family homes have been built in Sailboat Bend in the last several years. You can drive around and you see vacant lots, you see houses that you guys have approved, no construction's even started on them. So I, I'm not sure why that's happened, but in the big picture, the neighborhood has not grown or developed or even tried to become a better neighborhood in the last several years. It's pretty much stagnated. And we're trying to do something to make that area a little better. You want to go on your own? Or do you want to? Well, they, the, applicants, the applicant's family has owned this property since 1924. Or, uh, no, 1920, yes, 1924. The, the, he is the grandson of the lady that owned the house in 1924. The house that was, was replaced was only replaced because it caught on fire and burned, burned. And as such, they couldn't afford to move to another house. This house uh, that they moved, which is on, was on Briar Boulevard, that house that they moved to this location was the cheapest option at the time. They couldn't afford to build a new house. So they relocated one and retrofitted it. And that's where we stand with this. His family has owned this house continuously through various members of the family. And to deny him the ability to redevelop it, it does, it's not really fair. That's all. Mr. Chair, I wanted Thank to you so much. follow up uh, well, the applicant one, comment with a question for Trish. Sure. Which is rele relevant to what the applicant has just been saying. I also did not understand that why this building was designated as contributing when it's recommended for demolition. Well, let me proposed. let me hold hold that question for a minute, Trish. Remember to come back for that. I want to get to questions, but let me open it to the public first. Oh, All right, so let's go ahead to public comment. Are there any members of the public in the chambers that wish to be heard on this item? Seeing none. All right, are there any members of the public online joining us remotely that wish to be heard on this item? Please go ahead and signify raising your hand by clicking the little button on the bottom that says reactions and then raise hand. None. Seeing none. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comment if anybody pops up or wishes to be heard. Of course, you know, as we leniently do, we'll reopen that. Uh, but Mr. Marcus, now we will address your question to Trish. So go ahead, Trish. Uh, Thank you. This property is not being recommended for demolition. Okay. But, but it's a request from the applicant. But, but I, 
it's a request from the applicant, but why? It's, okay, so, but I still, I guess, okay, it's proposed for demolition. I apologize for my wording oh. change. So if it, it, it sounds like maybe I'm reading too much in here that it, there is no historic value to the house and it would probably be demolished if it were not for the contributing label. So I'm just troubled as to why it was contributing or was that a blanket designation for the neighborhood? It wasn't a blanket designation. Um, the, the proposal for contributing and non-contributing status assignments throughout Sailboat Bend came before the Historic Preservation Board on multiple occasions. And the report was shared with the board for your review right. prior to being put on an agenda to adopt it. Um, this particular structure is of, a, of the frame vernacular style. It's within the time period that's significant to the district. And there are comparable structures throughout the neighborhood that are also deemed contributing. So it collectively within the, the historic context and within the context of the other structures that are of the same typology, it was deemed contributing as recommended by staff and adopted by. So being moved would not enter the equation here? No, being moved does not disqualify it, especially in the Sailboat Bend Historic District. There's multiple structures throughout the district that have been moved over time, and it's um, something that was actually prevalent historically within the city of Fort Lauderdale. And you did say in the report that there were several other examples of this type of house or very similar to this type of house. Correct, yep. Uh, just to add, uh, the um, resolution listing the contributing and non-contributing properties, it came before the Historic Preservation Board in April of 2021, and then it went to the City Commission um, in May of 2021. This application was submitted in August of 2021. All right, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and uh, go down the line. Mr. Parker, any comments on this side? Uh, Go ahead and know. really, really eat that mic for me, Dave. Get in there. Okay. I don't know how appropriate for my comments would be. I was aware in this property at the back, the alley coming from Waverly over to Fourth goes to this property, takes a right. It does not go on or it's not paved, goes on through the back of this property. But there are tri marks of a previously either that there was an alley going from the start of this property to fourth now, i don't know if that is if uh that plays anything in here in in respect to this property i don't know either i don't know i don't either that's why i'm asking right. i'm not sure i understood what you said dave you regarding the alley is that what you're describing there was an alley started there was Paved alley at right. Waverly comes to the edge of this property, right. takes a right angle, 90 degree angle, and is paved. But this, the rest of that alley was marked off. It is marked off with wood and so forth in that property. And there are plenty of track marks that I think previously has been used as an alley. Yeah, and, the alley stops at West Las Olas and it runs east. Or excuse it me, goes south on to fourth, south, yeah, to and fourth I, to the river, yeah. but I, I don't think it's ever. I don't think it's. I didn't know if that was. I'm just throwing this anymore. in. Got it as part of information. On mm. so are you saying it's unpaved? Is that what it's you're unpaved, saying? right? Okay. The city paved the other, and, but it does not. And why would that have something to do with this application? Well, I was just putting that on the focus, you know, of okay. the property itself. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marcus, any other comments? Or... Okay. Mr. Carney? Nothing to add. Thank you, Mr. Chavon. Don't forget Ms. Lyons when I'm done. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I'm going to go to Ms. Lyons, and then Mr. Rose is going to be last. My, I guess my question is, because um, I'm just, just for clarification, contributing, not contributing, in the Sailboat Bend Historic District, if it, is, if it was not contributing, would we, we wouldn't be here? We would be here. You okay. still have to go through the process for a request for demolition. Right. It's just that by identifying at it as non-contributing, it's saying it doesn't meet the criteria to be considered contributing within the context of this historic district. But just for my own future references, 
contributing and or non-contributing can uh, an application can be put in for demolition correct even though it's a contributing building to the district yes. uh, historically yes. so they can ask yes there is a process available to all property owners to make the request and the family has had this home since the 20s at, at that look once that home was moved it was in your family and it's been there ever since always been in the family uh, Cliff Berry, uh, uh, 2201 Sunrise Key Boulevard. Thank you. Um, my my grandma, uh, my father and my grandmother lived at that site, at that address, um, since the 20s. But their part of their house burned down. They used to use kerosene mm -hmm. with, and the floor right. got soaked with kerosene, and the and the uh, kitchen burned down. Well, they they actually lived in that house without a kitchen for many years, from what my dad reports and. Um, and then fast forward to when it was uh, trucked over there, um, um, my uncle Gene, who was a single man, he was a post postal letter carrier in Fort Lauderdale for 60 years or 50 years, uh, lived there as a single guy, and he, he and his mother moved the house onto the property. Okay. And, All right. Um, Thank you. So Appreciate it. Thanks, That's sir. it, boss. All right. Ms. Lyons, any comments, questions? Well, on my question is this. You've explained what you'll do if it is demolished. What will you do if it is if it if you don't get permission to demolish it? Hmm. Yeah, that'd be a question for the applicant or the owner. Well, I, I really hadn't given that a lot of thought. Well, I, it's pretty important. Okay, I just know my my uncle Gene, who passed recently, and I had a discussion before he passed. I think he would be very proud to see that redeveloped into some nice houses so that young new families can move in. I don't think um, nothing against my uncle, but the place is a kind of a, he didn't really take care of it too much. I don't know if anyone well, would live there right now. I read so, in the letter that you submitted that it's in very bad repair. I'm just wondering what you would do with it if we do not give you permission to demolish it. I know you haven't given it a lot of thought, but could you address the issue? Or is that inappropriate? No, I don't think it's inappropriate. I just don't know that the applicant has an answer. <laughs> He's kind of throwing his hands up. You can't see him, Ms. Lines. He's kind of throwing his hands up. Shaking no, I can't see him. him. Yeah. Can I? I think you have to consider, you know, I mean, would you sell the property? Would you, I mean, what would, do you have a, you don't have any idea? No, ma'am, not right now. I hadn't given it much thought before tonight. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, so. it's fine. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thanks, Ms. Lines. Mr. Rosa. Questions, comments? Yeah, I got a, I got a number here. Great. So, um, I know the corner exceptionally well. You know, with the exception of Mr. Barry and his family, I think I've walked this corner with my dog, with my son, thousands of times. And the fact that it is in the survey as a contributing property baffles me. Um, this is, and I mean this with all due respect to the applicant, one of the most difficult properties to walk by as it being an eyesore. It is in disrepair. It is seemingly a liability as it currently stands if someone were to wander onto it. It is so baffling to me to sit here to have to think about how this is up for a, a consideration that we would make when I think uniquely we're sitting here with the legacy of the family that's looking to literally redevelop it. And I think if, if we're to give some policy weight to what we would want to see in an ideal situation from a redevelopment standpoint, it would be that the legacy of the family from one of the original owners, if not the original owner from when it was platted, I don't know how far back it goes, but I read the narrative. I think that that's about as good as it gets from what we want to achieve. And this is, and I'll go into a 30 second version. This is what drives me sometimes very, um, frustrated with Sailboat Bend is I feel that Sailboat Bend has to find a way through this scenario where in any, literally any other neighborhood in, this, in the city, we're not here. And I understand, and I live there, so I'm coming from a place of very much qualified response here. This is, this is not something that should be considered historic in any way whatsoever. And I would implore you to really, really consider that. And if you didn't drive by, I know Dave has seen it, if you didn't see it, I think you'd be hearing very loudly and clearly what, I, what I'm saying about this property. Um, I own a house two doors down. Nothing would make me 
feel better knowing that this corner was being redeveloped. And to the applicant's point, you don't see a lot of redevelopment in Sailboat Bend. And I think this is part of the reason. I don't think a lot of people want to come here and, and go through this channel, but I applaud the applicant for doing so, even in the face of a staff report which indicated that it should not be demolished. But I just don't see in any way what criteria it meets. And I would implore this board to vote against the staff recommendation and in favor of allowing for the demolition to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Rosa. Yes. All right. Can I, uh, yes. can I say something, Chair? Yes. Uh, Ms. Lines, I'm going to go to Mr. Parker first, and okay. then we'll come back to you. Fine. Fine. Mr. Parker? OK. The Civic Association. Eat that microphone, Dave. Get into that mic. It's on. Yep. OK. The Civic Association did see this disrepair for many years. We went in there and cleared up the lot, the side with all the trees and everything to make it more acceptable. But we, I fully agree that this has been a long-term kind of a thing. And even though most people think I want to preserve everything that's out there, I don't think that it's appropriately to preserve this one here. I think in the circumstances, it should be considered for demolition. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Lines. Well, I was just going to wonder how we'd feel if the other side of the coin were that you'd fix the house up and create a look that's similar to the very lovely one that Trish showed us and make it a very appealing property and sell it. So I think we have to look at both sides of the coin. And the owners have the option of doing that. Mr. Rosa, you look I, I just don't see, you know, to, just to respond, um, Ms. Lyons, I don't, I don't well, I guess the first question would be, why couldn't that be done with a property that didn't suffer from some of the very clear deficiencies that this building suffers from? So going back to our last, it wasn't, it was an agenda item. I, I've got to believe there's structural issues with this one as well, as well as many other issues that would just, I don't even know how you would insure this building. That, that, that's how bad it is in, in the type of condition. It literally looks like it's leaning over. So I don't know what we would be saving. And, and, it, and it happened one time where that did happen. And it was on the same street, coincidentally, uh, two blocks, maybe north. Um, and it got, I don't know how he did it, but, but at the time, it was a, it was a different situation. I'll, 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 I'll draw the comparison this way. It, it, there was just one house, and in this case, there's one house on a lot which could be sub, subdivided to three lots. So seeing that as it is with an applicant who's, who's looking to achieve three new construction single family homes, I, I don't know, I personally don't know why we would want to consider trying to remedy and trying to renovate and, and repurpose and rehabilitate the existing structure. I just, I, I don't see it making any, any sense, especially with a lack of what I believe is historical contributing um, significance of this structure. Thank you, Mr. Rosa. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the uh, the discussion on this matter. I think that that we're we're starting to run into a situation where um, we're repeating ourselves um, generally. But um, so at this point in time, I would entertain a motion uh, on this resolution, or excuse me, on this item. I'll make a motion. All right, Mr. Marcus wishes to make a motion. I motion to get into that microphone, Art. Motion to deny the resolution first. I'm sorry to approve. The resolution for a certificate of appropriateness for demolition under case number UDP HP 21029, located at 404 Southwest 12th Avenue, based on the following findings of fact, as, as contained in the staff report, staff memorandum, and uh, the two conditions that are listed above. Um, do I have to state the conditions? or uh, That the demolition of the structure shall not negatively impact the adjacent historic district and protection from construction debris and construction equipment shall be provided as necessary and that the application subject to the approval of the building zoning and all ULDR requirements. Are those the two conditions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yes, but uh, the staff report is, the finding in the staff report is, does not meet the criteria. So my suggestion would be, um, you may want to make a finding that in uh, in accordance with 472411D4, 
I, 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 the demolition is of a major benefit to the historic district. You could make that finding or you could make another finding under 472411D3CID that the denial of the certificate of appropriateness would deprive the property owner of all beneficial use of the property. So those are just things I'm throwing above. out there. All of the above. Okay. So I, I think the motion will include both of those include uh, subsections as to the finding. Because I think everybody would agree to that. Yeah, we got that. I think I think you're you're on point there. Okay, um, the motion being made is there a second to the motion? I second. Seconded by Mr. Parker. Uh, Ms. Wallen, would you go ahead and read the resolution, if you would, please? A resolution of the Historic Preservation Board of the City of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, approving a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition of a single-family residence located at 404 Southwest 12th Avenue, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, case number UDP HP 21029. Thank you so much. So. Uh, the motion being made to approve uh, the resolution for the certificate of appropriateness for demolition as cited by Ms. Wallen uh, and seconded at this point in time, we will call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Ms. Lyons votes no. Thank you so much. Any abstentions? <laughs> Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Good luck. All right. Uh, that'll bring us to the next item on the agenda. Item 4.E, Certificate of Appropriateness for Major Alteration, case number UDP HP 21035. After the fact, installation of a six-foot high privacy fence, we love our fences here, at address 317 Southwest 9th Avenue, uh, 1 to 3. Um, and the applicant is Gabriel Duque. I hope I said that right. Did I say that right? Nailed it. All right, good. Um, let's go ahead and start with disclosures. Mr. Parker, any disclosures on this item? Dave, any disclosures? I visited the property. All right. Drive by? Walk by something similar? No Are there nothing? None on my end. Ms. Carney? Don't disclose. Thank you. Shavon? No disclosure. Rosa? None. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Drive by. Drive by. Thank you so much. All right. Disclosures having been made. Trish, can we have the staff report? Sure. Good evening. This is for the request of an after the fact um, installation of a six foot high privacy fence um, for a non contributing structure. The property is located. On a semi-corner lot abutting um, an alleyway and the the fence has already been installed as you can see in the photograph on your screen the location of the fence is highlighted in red on the property survey and it is set back from the street but does block visibility from um, the right-of-way into the actual front of the structure which is something that goes against our um, our design guidelines <laughs> so in that way, it doesn't meet our regulations um, uh, through multiple criteria in the general criteria for certificate of appropriateness, um, for a certificate of appropriateness for major alteration. Um, neither of them are met as they, the design guidelines do recommend doing a 36 inch high fence with 30% visibility um, on the front of structures. And within our material and design guidelines, it, it partially meets the material and design guidelines where it does um, have the wood fencing quality of the material that's recommended. But along the front, it does say that there should be, um, well, there's a maximum spacing that's provided within the code for consideration. So in accordance with sections 472411 D. D3CI and 472411D3CII of the ULDR, staff finds that the application for a COA for major alterations under case number UDP-HP 21035 located at 317 Southwest 9th Avenue does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CI of the ULDR and does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CII of the ULDR and partially meets the criteria as outlined in section 4717 of the ULDR. Um, there is one condition for the consideration of the board of this application is to be approved and that is that this application is subject to the approval by building zoning and all ULDR requirements, including landscaping. Thank you very much, Trish. Okay, uh, we have the applicant present. If you could go ahead and approach the lectern, uh, you'll have 15 minutes to address the board. Please state your name and your address uh, prior to starting. Good evening, thank you. My name is Gabriel Duque, and I live at 416 Northwest 47th Court in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, or Oakland Park, to be more exact. Um, 
the reason this fence uh, was built is that uh, the windows behind it are uh, the windows into, the, into unit one of my building. Uh, I've owned this building since uh, 2015, and I've had several tenants live in that, in that unit, uh, actually all of them uh, single women. And there's a serious issue with privacy because people walk uh, through that alley that has uh, heavy foot traffic, and a lot of them end up turning right into my, into my building because they complain that people turn too fast into the alleyway. So for a uh, safety reason, they walk right in front of my building and look right through the windows. The other problem is at night, as cars drive uh, east to west on this, on this alley, they shine straight into the bedroom of the unit, um, which forces my tenants to have to keep heavy drapery on the windows at all times. Um, it, it, it really diminishes the quality of life for this unit. This is, a, this is a small unit. Basically, the two windows that we're providing some privacy to give you a complete view into the entire unit. Uh, this picture that you're seeing is obviously an up-close picture. If you look at the... Uh, I, I actually provided a picture on page 11 of my application. I don't know if that can be shown, but uh, the fence is barely visible from the street because uh, it's about 48 feet away from the street. Uh, if you turn right at the corner of, of, my, of where my building is, almost all the houses on the left side and some of the houses on the right side have uh, very tall fencing. Some of them have concrete walls, uh, as tall or taller than mine, uh, and yet they're probably eight to 10 feet from the street, completely visible, uh, mine's not. I, you know, as independent landlords, we provide housing for most people that rent in, in, this, in this country. And I take my responsibility seriously. I bought this property with, um, uh, you know, my down payment came from money from my uh, 401k and, and a severance uh, check that I received after, work, after working 13 years for Citrix Systems. And I wanted it to mean something, and I really enjoy being able to provide safe housing uh, for people, young people. Uh, but. It's a beautiful neighborhood, but unfortunately, our properties have challenges. When, when I put the unit on the market to rent, uh, I'm competing against uh, luxury buildings. We know that they're going up everywhere in Fort Lauderdale. They have all kinds of amenities. They have you know, lobbies and security and doormen and um, pools and stuff. And I believe that if we're not able to, as independent landlords, to provide some limited, uh, at least some, some minimum security and comfort, it puts us at a disadvantage and greatly diminishes my ability to, uh, to rent uh, my unit at a competitive price and for me to be able to uh, pay all the significant costs that we have with insurance and all that, provided that you know, this, this is an older building. So that's why I'm humbly asking that this application is approved. I, I really think that um, you know, I've had a lot of situations with uh, tenants complaining that there's men looking through the window. In one situation, somebody got close to the window and my tenant called me very nervous. Um, this, again, this fence is barely visible from the street. Uh, my building, I don't know if it's designating con contributed or not, but I don't feel that I'm covering anything. Um, again, you can't barely see from the street, so I, even, even if it was historical, you prob I, I wouldn't be covering much that landscaping and distance uh, isn't already covering. I have two rows of fencing before this one that kind of uh, separate parking and stuff way before you even get to this. Um, and obviously those, th that fencing is similar to the one you can see on the side of this picture, so it's up to historic preservation code. Um, my point is it's barely visible from the street. It, it really, a lot, of, a lot of other buildings in the neighborhood have them and they're uh, uh, right up to the street, uh, it's providing value, it's making someone's life better, and I feel that that's my responsibility, and it, I guess that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, are there any members of the public wishing to be heard on this item in the chambers? Seeing none, are there any members of the public online joining us uh, remotely that wish to be heard on this item? Yes, we have one person who has their hand raised, Ken Farmer. Great. If we can move them over, I don't know if they've been moved over already. They have. All right, wonderful. If you could please unmute yourself, uh, go ahead and turn your camera on, and if you could state your name, 
Give us your address, and then you will have two minutes to address the board. Ken, you're able to unmute yourself now. I know Mr. Farmer actually signed up for one of our later items, but he did has, have his hand raised. What is there for you guys? Not for yeah. this item. He's here for a different item. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, no, that's all right. We're going to uh, assume that he doesn't want to speak on this one. And if I'm wrong, feel free to unmute yourself and let me know. But we're going to go ahead and close public comment then. With that being said, thanks for letting us know about that, guys. Um, and we'll bring it to the board uh, for any questions or comments. Mr. Parker, anything? No, I, I I understand his concern for the privacy, but he also in the he also in the front. If you see that side uh, picket little fence on the side, he also has that in front of this other fence, the bigger one, that's only about maybe ten feet from the street. So that's also trying to give more protection to his tenants. Okay, Mr. Marcus. Uh, yeah, I have, first I have two questions for um, staff, for Tricia. First is, we've seen projects or proposals like this before come before the board. Get in there, Art. Get into that microphone. Uh, we have seen these type of proposed projects come before the board. Can you refresh our memory as to what we've done in the past? Um, with other requests that have come before the board for after-the-fact fencing, right. um, that was not, that was too high. I remember that. was too them. high. On some occasions, the board has approved, but with a lower height. So for the four foot height right. um, solid fence that. without. Yeah. Without I, I would just space. caution you about that. You really want to determine this application based on its own merits and its I understand. own facts and not use any other application to make your uh, determination. But we do have a. Everything we sit, talk about here sets a precedent. No, it does not. The court does sets not. a precedent, not this board. Okay, okay. Then my question also then is landscaping. Could the applicant use landscaping to cover the fence so it would not be seen? It's the same concept within the design guidelines where it's talking about blocking the view to the front of structures with fencing or other materials, no matter what it is including landscaping. So how high could landscaping go if one wanted to put landscaping in? Is there a height limit? There's not a height limit prescribed, but it's um, the overall concept is to maintain visibility into the front of structures so that you create a more uh, pedestrian-friendly environment and maintain consistency throughout the district. Thank you. Ms. Lines. Well, I was going to ask the same question about landscaping and if it had been possible to do this with tall bushes rather than this fence. So other than that, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lines. Mr. Rosa. Um, I, I know we're looking at this at the face of the application, but I, I specifically remember one particular application. It was, um, it was a green vinyl fence that we approved. And it came out beautifully. I drive by it every day. And it's a lot nicer than what was there before. Which, and it was blocking. It was a junkyard at one point. They didn't want to acknowledge as much. Um, I'm looking at this in the photos that were submitted with the application. Arthur, I think you should look at this picture because it'll give you exactly what you're asking about. This, this looks to be, the applicant described 48 feet. This looks to be about 50 feet back. The average front setback in Sailboat Bend in most of the RML 25 district is 25 feet. I, I can't see this from the right of way. I'm, I'm looking, I'm zooming, I'm zooming in, I'm zooming out, and hearing the narrative as to why, not just arbitrarily, but he wants his tenants to feel a reassurance of security. Um, totally understand that. I think that that's a fair point. Um, additionally, the picket fence that's in front of this kind of does like a zigzag, um, does, I, I think, exactly accomplish what we do want to see from the right of way. So, if you look at the landscaping that's in front of it, if you look how far back it is, if you acknowledge the fact that you can't see it from the right away and that the prescribed fencing that we do want to see is all there, I think this is uniquely situated to be permissible, um, especially so considering the why. Um, and I, I, ideally, we're not looking at it after the fact, but we are. So, you know, in light of that, that's the, that's the one negative. But I, I think all things considered, 
I, I'm okay with it. Um, I can't see it. I can't see it from the right away. And I think that's so much of what the guideline looks to achieve is, is avoiding that visibility. And in this case, it doesn't apply. So I would be, I would be in favor in this case of accepting it and allowing for it. Thank you. Mr. Carney. Nothing to comment. Thank you, Mr. Chavone. Ditto to what Mr. Rosa said, word for word. Okay, echoing those sentiments. Mr. Duque, I have a question for you. Why didn't you come to us before you did this? I can tell, I can give you the reasons, but I know I now know that my reasons are all wrong. I was I was incorrect. Um, we had uh, the remnants of a fence in when I bought the building, and in my incorrect thinking, I thought that because there was a fence there at one point, that I could just replace it. Understood. Okay, um, I will entertain a motion at this time. Well, wait, before I do that, is there any other comment or question from any member of the board? I want to make sure everybody has their place. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Will this pass code? Will this, have you gone before the city for this fence yet? This is a required step to complete the, the, uh, the, the process. I, I am in the process of getting a permit. But are you familiar with whether or not you're too high to begin with? Does the city allow a six-foot fence where you live? Yeah, it should it should be all as far as the city is concerned. It is it is within code. Okay. All right. I, I get I get the need to 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 give to give a sense of security for the tenants, but I, I'm troubled by. Um, I think the key factor is that it's not visible from the right of way, right? Like that's, but then that, I guess, I'm sorry, I'm kind of thinking out loud here. I apologize to everybody, but as I'm trying to work through this in my own mind, um, Trish, if it's not visible from the right of way, why is there a problem with it in staff's opinion? Uh, if a fence is not visible from the right of way and not located in front of a structure, then it wouldn't come before the board. But in this, in this case, it is in front of the structure. In front of the structure. I understand. Mm -hmm. All right. If, go. Oh, if I on. may say something. Yeah, Mr. Duque, go other, for it. The other reason, uh, the other serious reason we, we did it is because of the issue of cars driving in the night. And there is a... Could you speak into the mic? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There is significant density of uh, uh, multifamilies, uh, at the end of that alley. So there is a lot of traffic at night through that alley and the light is really annoying. Even with heavy drapes, they, they still have this effect of a, you know, blinking light. I've had a lot of tenants have issues with that and complain. I'll be candid, I'll be candid with you, Mr. Duque. I don't find that, I don't find that to be a compelling reason to, to grant the application personally. Um, the security matter, I think, is, is a greater concern, at least to me. Um, but I, at this point in time, I think that we've uh, we've discussed the matter. I would entertain a motion if one were to be had on this item. I would love to make one, but I don't have the staff report in front of me. Uh, I managed to exit out, and I don't have the exact language. I'll I'll go up and grab. You wing it, and I'll help. I'll work or here. Grab the hard copy from Arthur. <laughs> there you go. Get your Cliff's notes. I would make a motion to approve the resolution for certificate of appropriateness for major alterations under case number UDP HP 21035 located at 317 Southwest 9th Avenue based upon the following findings of fact. Um, Cherry, would you articulate one of the reasons you stated prior as to the reason we would deviate from the staff report in this case? Uh, well, this one's a little different, but okay. I'll try. <laughs> Um, well, I don't think, uh, I mean, I, I'll, you know, say what the different criteria is and you can pick one because sure. I don't want to make it, give you an opinion on that, but the effect of the proposed work on the landmark or the property upon which the work is to be done, um, that's one, the relationship between such work and the other structures on the landmark site or other property in the historic district that that's included in the staff report, but I believe that you all made a determination that the fence is not visible from the right of way. Yeah, so, so I, I would lean on that one specifically. Okay. okay. Um, would you like me to restate that, Mr. Chair? We'll uh, take her. 
Does everybody understand the motion so, in that regard? Yeah. So just to be clear, it's 472411D3CIB. Uh, the finding is that it meets this criteria because the fence is not visible from the right of way. Correct. Um, and subject to the following conditions, which were the building code conditions. Uh, the application is subject to building zoning, ULDR requirements, including landscaping. Thank you, Mr. Rosa. Mr. Chair, I have a friendly amendment to propose. Uh, well, one minute, because we have to see if there's a second first. So hang on two seconds, Mr. Marcus. Hold that thought. Is there a second to Mr. Rosa's motion? I'll try a second. All right, seconded by Mr. Parker. <laughs> Mr. Marcus uh, offering a friendly I'm amendment. Uh, my, my friendly amendment is I would urge that the applicant, if this is approved, plant landscaping that would cover the fence so that it would not be seen. I mean, I understand that it's not seen, but I think it would be more in compliance with the neighborhood and soften the look. We fully intended, in fact, to do that uh, when we received the notice. Of okay. So that's still your intent? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What, is, what is your intent? I didn't hear you. Uh, we, we fully intended on, on planting hedges in front of the fence to make it more appealing. That, that would my, my concern would be right. my concern would be other people having to look at it. The hedge or the fence? The fence. Well, that's why we're talking about maybe using the landscaping to conceal the fence. I, th I think we've been here as much, Arthur, as I would yeah. love to include it. I think the purview of landscape is, is falling beyond our scope here. So let's, if it's okay, if you're okay, we'll leave it in, in its current form and we'll take Dave's second and keep it rolling. Sounds good. Let's uh, go ahead and He's call tried. that. But before He's we tried, do, I'm going to have, uh, I'm have Ms. Wallen go ahead and read the resolution. A resolution of the Historic Preservation Board of the City of Port Lauderdale, Florida, approving a certificate of appropriateness for a major alteration after the fact for the installation of a six-foot high wood vertical stockade fence located at 317 uh, Southwest 9th Avenue, 1 to 3, Port Lauderdale, Florida, case number UDP HP 21035. Thank you. The resolution having been read, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Nay from Ms. Lines. Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you so much. Good Thank luck. you. Thank you. All right. That will bring up our next item on the agenda. Yes, we have more, folks. But there's more. We have two more. All right. Uh, item 4.F, Certificate of Appropriateness for New Construction, case number UDP HP 21036, installation of a one-story pergola patio bar in Courtyard, Applicant Jay Adams at uh, 901 Progressive Drive. Uh, let's go ahead and do, oh, we're, uh, uh, getting, we're wait, getting party favors. Uh, we have to know what that is. So yeah. somebody has to state on the record gonna, what you're having. I'm the board. on it. I'm on it. Okay. We're going to, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, firstly, we are going to go ahead and do disclosures. Mr. Parker, any disclosures on the side? Yes, I visit. Can the applicant please provide that to staff as well? Yeah, please give a copy to uh, Trish if you could. Go ahead, Dave. Disclosures? I visited. Yes, I visited. The site. Get into that microphone. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. The site, yeah. Visited. Okay, thank you. Site visit. Go ahead, Mr. Marcus. A drive by and site visit. Ms. Lyons, any disclosures? Drive by. Okay, drive by. Nothing to disclose. Mr. Carney, no disclosures. Drive by. Mr. Chavon drove by. I have no disclosures to make. Mr. Rosa stepped out of the chambers for a moment. While we were going through and, in, and announcing the item, we were presented with uh, a elevation drawing as well as a site, plan. a site plan and a what appears to be a response of some sort uh, from the architectural group, Alica Architectural Group, um, from, let's see if there's an author. Actually, it's showing the location of the pergola, which was not shown. It's applicant before. responses in writing um, from the architect uh, to the criteria for certificate of appropriateness. We'll go ahead and make both of these part of the record. Copies have been provided to all board members present in chambers. Has an electronic copy been provided to Ms. Lines from whoever gave that to us? I, I have the copy. I have the hard copy. Okay, so Ms. Lyons has a copy that was presented to the board. I don't believe you've gotten this addendum, Ms. Lyons, so I apologize to that. This is a last-minute addition, it appears, from the applicant. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, do our best to, to walk you through it if, if it's uh, being referenced at all. Okay, so with that, um, the applicant, is there an applicant or their representative present? And if so, thank you so much. You're going to have 15 minutes to address the board. Please state your name and give us your address uh, on the record prior to beginning. 
Uh, good evening, Stephen Tilbrook with Ackerman Law Firm, uh, 201 East Broward Boulevard. Do me a favor, counsel. Go ahead and get into that microphone when you're up there because we want to make sure everybody online and in this room can hear what you have to say. Don't be afraid to speak up. We have a few items. I'd like to go ahead and put this on the screen, screen now. Good. Chair, would you like to start with the staff report? I would. You know what? That would definitely be a good starting point, as it usually is. I'm sorry, counsel. Hang on two seconds. While you're getting that set up, Trish, why don't you go ahead and run through your staff report? Sure. So that's just as stated, this is a certificate of appropriateness for new construction for the installation of a one-story pergola patio bar in the front courtyard. This is at Progresso Plaza, which is a designated historic landmark in the city of Fort Lauderdale. The pergola is, placed, is proposed to be placed directly in front of the structure. The structure would be open on all four sides with a half wall supporting a counter height bar that wraps around the entire perimeter with an overhead gate to fully enclose the pergola when not in use. Access to the interior bar would be through a, a Dutch door on one end of the structure. Plans show an equipment plan for the structure to include coolers, wash stations, and storage. Uh, per, per our regulations, um, for the general criteria for a certificate of appropriateness, um, under criterion A, the effect of the proposed work on the landmark or the property in which such work is to be done. Um, as per our City of Fort Lauderdale's Historic Preservation Design Guidelines, when taking into consideration a secondary structure or accessory structure on a parcel, um, it's supposed to be subordinate to the historic structure. In this case, it's being proposed directly in front of the structure, the historic structure that's designated. And to, part of the other portion of the criteria is to minimize its visual impact. Um, it states that small structures should be located in the rear yard and should not block the view of a historic building or features from the public way. Although the structure could be removed in the future because it is standalone, um, the proposed placement of the pergola pizza bar is directly in front of the historic landmark on the site and it will visually impact the, the appearance of the historic landmark. Do you have a question, Mr. I did. Marcus? My, my, my question was, there is no rear yard, so what does one do in this situation? Correct. There isn't, but that's not the way that our, our code or regulations read, and this is Gosh, we need a lot of elaboration in this code, don't we? Um, so this is up for the consideration of the Historic Preservation Board. It is a constricted site where it does have a zero lot line on two sides of the property, and the front elevation does face uh, an open courtyard. Under Criterion B, the relationship between such work and other structures on the landmark site or other property in the historic district, again, related to the location of this, uh, this proposed structure, it's problematic per our regulations. Uh, the next section of the code that would be applicable is the Certificate of Appropriateness section for new construction. Um, mostly this is pertaining to its placement and the location that's visually impacting uh, the, the visual aspect of the new construction project, the pergola placed directly in front of the historic structure. Um, so with that, staff finds that the application for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction under case number UDP-HP21036, located at 901 Progresso Drive, does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CI of the ULDR and does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CII of the III of the ULDR. And there's um, just one condition for the consideration of the board of this is to be approved, and that would be that the application is subject to the approval by building zoning and all ULDR requirements. Thank you, Trish. Sorry for jumping the gun on you. That's okay. All right, that'll bring us to the applicant. Now you have 15 minutes to address the board if you'd like. Oops, let's get that started back. Uh, and just go ahead and again, if you could, please place your name again on the record uh, and uh, with whom you represent. Good evening, uh, Stephen Tilbrook, speaking into the mic this time. Not yet. Go ahead and get into that microphone. You're not in there yet. <laughs> oh, that maybe that's why it's not on. I think there's a button maybe on the bottom of that, on the base that you need to push. Okay. 
Chair, he has a some documents that he wants to share, paper documents. I just need like eight more minutes for me to get it up for you guys. <laughs> okay. I can I can start. Okay. So for the record, Steve Tilbrook with Ackerman Law Firm, 201 East Broward Boulevard, uh, East Los Olas Boulevard, excuse me. Uh, I would thank you for uh, being available and thank you for your service. I'm a former member of the Historic Preservation Board myself. I know how important your job is. And I want to thank you for all you're doing. Uh, we're here representing Urban North LLC. Uh, Urban North is the owner of the property located at 901 Progresso Drive. We're going to work with him here while he uh, completes his process of showing some of the... It's important that we show the actual conditions today rather than just the historical photograph. So with us today, we have Jay Adams, the principal of, uh, of Urban North. Jay is right in, right in, in many of you know Jay, because Jay is one of the principal owners and preservationists for commercial buildings in Fort Lauderdale. He's owned this building for 17 years, and he's been before you several times on applications for certificates of, of appropriateness. And recently, uh, in 2019, we actually were here for this particular same building for doors and windows for this particular tenant. This is all, I haven't done this before with, it, with the help. Thank you. Um, so glad uh, to have the help. I uh, think those photographs are going to be important. So we also have uh, Brian uh, Parento. Brian is the tenant, uh, the operator of the restaurant. And we also have... Uh, Robert Alicia Architect with us as well with the Alicia Architectural Group. So the address is uh, 901 Progresso Drive. Jay Adams uh, and Urban North have been the owner for 17 years. Um, there's 17 tenants in the building, in case that question comes up. Of particular interest is the tenants on the ground floor, the restaurant and, and bar on the ground floor that is seeking to become open and operating. Uh, the, this certificate of appropriateness is for a 200 square foot, 240 square foot pergola. It's a small, unenclosed structure uh, uh, that is that in the courtyard that is in front of the building. The, there happens to be a courtyard. I really wanted to show you is the photos of that courtyard. It's an unimproved courtyard. It's not a very attractive courtyard, and it's um, and it's not being utilized or improved right now. And you know what? If we don't have the photos, I can I can hand them around too. You know, it's possible. Um, so the building itself is around 12,000 uh, 12, square feet, uh, but the pergola is only 240 square feet and only eight feet in height. Um, and so the criteria are set forth in your code, whether or not the denial, uh, in, in one of the criteria that wasn't referenced is whether or not the denial of certificate of appropriateness would divide, uh, deprive the property owner of all reasonable use of the property. For this particular courtyard, there is no other use of the property. All we're seeking is to use the courtyard. Uh, there's, you know, we had a lively discussion, Tricia and I did early, and Jay did earlier today about whether or not anything, any use of the, pro of the courtyard is appropriate. We believe that activating uh, in a commercial space that courtyard is the right thing to do. It's important for that building to have an active courtyard and have an active space in front. And so that's why we're here. Um, we believe that the application is reasonable, it's responsible, it's thoughtful, it's compatible, it's consistent with height and scale with the existing building. It complements the existing building. And I'll show you in just a second how it does. Uh, and that the relationship of materials are appropriate and consistent as well. So we have Robert here to talk about it. Let me just walk you through a few items. Uh, this this particular item right in front of you. Thank you so much for your help. I really Good appreciate work. it. That was that was awesome. You got it all. Hey, you earned your money tonight, man. You know? Got all his work done uh, while I was doing my presentation. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is. You didn't a, miss a beat. I <laughs> this is a scale drawing uh, of the building itself, showing the small court, small pergola that is proposed in the courtyard. There is a a privacy wall. There is actually a security wall. There has been a history of cars to drive along this uh, this road actually encroaching into 
uh, into the courtyard and hitting the building. Mm. And so uh, that wall was actually constructed by DOT as a way to provide protection and safety. It impairs the view of the first floor of the building. And I'll show you. Uh, let's see. Here. Steve, how tall is it, the wall? I think... I think it's about well the, with the columns are the columns are probably eight feet tall, okay. and the and the wall I think is about four feet tall. That's it. This is not a pretty picture, folks. But that's what the courtyard looks like now. Uh, and frankly, to make it a better courtyard, a better building, a more contributing historic building in this community, we believe that a a and a structure within the courtyard is appropriate and necessary. That's, I think that's where I say it up there. Yeah. All right. So this is the view uh, of the building. It is impaired by landscaping. It's impaired by the wall. And frankly, the view is from the railroad tracks. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about view. We're going to show you what that view looks like on the elevation. But uh, frankly, and there's also signs and street lights. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. We like to activate it and make it function better. That's another, that's another photo of the courtyard as it exists today. It could be so much better. All right, I'm going to go back to the elevation, and I'm going to introduce a project architect to, to explain to you how and why this is appropriate and meets the criteria of the code. Good evening, Robert, Le Good evening, Robert Leica, the architect. Um, I I want to start out by really apologizing for the, the original application. We just did an ele partial elevation of the existing building, and then we did the uh, obviously the elevations for the for that pergola bar. And realizing what the issues were, um, I realized that we should have done this drawing in front of you uh, in initially. Um, this little bar is is so small. Uh, compared to the existing building. I mean, and we can rattle off numbers. I mean, the, the bar takes up 3% of the site, uh, you know. Uh, there's also 262 lineal feet of the original building, and we're at 20. So, uh, um, so uh, you know, this, this bar, which, by the way, obviously, it's an accessory to that pizza place. Um, it's, it's a glorified weight station. Um, that, that's going to be, you know, hidden behind that fence. Um, the owner is spending uh, a lot of money on landscaping, so there will be a lot of lush, lush landscaping in this, um, in this courtyard. And this courtyard will be used by everyone there, all 17 tenants. Anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to... I'll go ahead and sum up by saying, uh, I'll just go back to your criteria and your code, that the effect of the proposed uh, work on a landmark property is consistent, it's compatible, and it's the right thing to do. Number two, that the relationship between such work and other structures on the landmark site uh, are appropriate. It's necessary, and it, if you look at this particular rendering, the, the pergola, and we're talking about the pergola here, really is consistent, has the same materials, it's compatible, and actually complements to the existing building. And, you know, just to comment on the fact that this is a commercial building. Commercial buildings have to grow and evolve over time and have to accommodate tenants in order for buildings to be, uh, to be successful and for the property to be maintained in the way it should be. We have a new tenant. We need to make ad um, uh, adjustments to the building to accommodate that tenant. This is compatible, it's consistent, it meets the criteria for your code, we, and we would appreciate uh, a motion to approve the application uh, consistent with item A, B, or C of the criteria. And we're here to answer any questions. Thank you, Council. Uh, with that, we will go and say, are there any members of the public who wish to be heard on this item in chambers? All right, go ahead, if you could please approach the lectern, uh, place your name on the record along with your address, and you will have two minutes to address the board. Hello, okay, I'm Brian Parento, 790 East Broward Boulevard, Fort Lauderdale. Um, I'm the tenant there, and this is just a mere 
a, a, it's an accessory to the restaurant. It's, um, it's going to ensure and allow me to service the courtyard. Without this, it's hard to service that courtyard. So then the courtyard really doesn't get any use. So this is just like, uh, you know, an accessory to the business. It's going to ensure the success of the business. And uh, it's just going to make everything uh, flow smoother, you know, for staff. And, you know, I'm putting a considerable investment into this. The landlord's putting in a considerable investment into this. The CRA has donated money into this because they uh, they believe in this project. So I think uh, I'm not trying to change the building. I love the building. I love that it's historic. Um, and I want to keep the building the way it is. That's why I'm there, because I like the historic nature of the building. So I'm trying to just get a small accessory put into this courtyard to be able to service the courtyard. So that, that's about it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Anybody else from the public wish to be heard on this item in chambers? Seeing none, anybody online who wishes to be heard on this item? We do not have anyone signed up to speak on this item. Okay, all right. We'll go ahead and close public comment and we will bring it to the board. We're gonna start on that end this time. Mr. Chavone, oh. you are a lead off hitter. Get me out of here early, huh? <laughs> Any um, comments? Well, you know, I am in this business. Um, for 50 years and uh, this is a this is a very complimentary well first let me start with I really don't see how this is in, interrupting any of the uh, visual corridor or the appreciation of the building uh, it's next to the railroad tracks and all that being considered the people who are really going to appreciate the historic preservation of this main building are the ones that are going to be on the property this is going to bring more people to that property. There's going to be more people enjoying and uh, and experiencing the historic preservation of that building because of this pagoda that's out front. Uh, from a standpoint of what the gentleman just spoke to, it is a, everything in our business has gone outside. This started way before COVID. And if you go to Europe and you go to off. Uh, over there, every all your cafes are outside. It's it started quite a while ago in America. Uh, I myself at the Parrot, we put a cafe license in, extended our sidewalks from six foot to fifteen feet, and the amount of business that we did was multiplied by two. So this is really an enhancement. Give him a greater capability to maintain his building, preserve the building, and do the right thing by being able to historically preserve a building and collect the dollars he needs to do it. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Nothing to comment. Thank you. Ms. Lines? Can you clarify what the function of the pergola is? The pergola, uh, pergola as, as far as a structure, is a shade structure. It's unenclosed. No, I know what it is. I just want to know how it's going to function. Are, are people going to eat there? Function. Are you serving drinks? What is it? It's going to function as a, as a shade structure that can accommodate um, servers and, and, and serving drinks, perhaps serving food, but it is an accessory to the restaurant. So in the sense that patrons will not be sitting there having cocktails, but it more is a service station? It's, it's more of a service station, yes. Robert Leake again, what I said before was, it's basically like a wait station. Get into that microphone for me, Robert. It's Appreciate it. there it's you go. basically <laughs> like a wait station. Um, you know, okay. Servers will bring food out. They will take their drinks, or, you know, prepare them there, and then distribute it to the patrons in the courtyard. I'm looking at the screen. I'm not really sure she's there. <laughs> okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure, thank you. Ms. Lines, anything else? No, thank you. Okay, no problem. Mr. Rosa. I, I didn't have a comment, but now I do just based off the last one. Was was it never thought to possibly be to, to accommodate patrons? Because the way I read it on the plan, it just read patio bar. That's... It, it, it could okay. accommodate patrons, and it very well might. Right. It could accommodate live music. Right. It could accommodate uh, it, when it's not being used by waitstaff, uh, tables and chairs. Right. It's an it's a open structure. Multifunction. Further comments from me? Thank you. Mr. Marcus. I have a few comments. First of all, I wanted to commend the owner on doing a wonderful restoration of the property. It really looks super. And it's a beautiful building to begin with, 
but you've made it look even better. Um, I certainly agree that the courtyard needs to be activated. And although the code states that we shouldn't put anything in front, I would have to respectfully disagree on this application because I think this is the only place to do it and it functions very well there for what you're intending or even what a future tenant may, may want to do. So I have no problem with the placement in the front. However, I do have one big issue. We are a historic preservation board. Could you speak into the mic? We, I'm sorry, I keep moving away. We are a historic preservation board. And as such, one of the guidelines in, I don't know if it's in our local guidelines, but in national guidelines, is that additions to historic building should not look like the historic building so that there's no uh, understanding in the future as to what's original and what's not. So all I would urge you to do, I mean, I see that you already have different tile on the roof that staff, it's the same tile. Well, I, I would respectfully suggest that I have no problem with this where it is, but I do think it needs to not be mistaken for, for the original building in the future, be that with a different color roof or, or maybe don't copy all the details of the curving arches or the base on the columns. I mean, there's just little things that might make that kind of difference. Even the rough stucco, that could be a smooth stucco. Can I answer? Of course. All right. Those tiles that I put on the original building, those are handmade tiles from Central America that weren't on the building when I bought it. They're $360 a yard now. I'd rather not do those, Right. <laughs> be honest with you. So we'll come up with something a little different I'm glad you pointed that out. I didn't even realize that was an well, item. It's, it's sort of generally accepted practice. I don't know yeah, if it's that, written in mm, stone. It's a requirement. I mean, it's, it's, it is part of the code of the guidelines. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm going to bring up in my comments as well. So We've, um, We absolutely looked into that. And if this building was attached, we absolutely respect the separation between the, the historic building and new. Um, seeing that it's freestanding, and not realizing the expense on those tiles, but seeing that it was freestanding and we wanted this thing to totally blend in with the building is why we opted to emulate the existing building. But if the board insists on changing it, be it the stucco or anything like that, uh, we would have to accept it, really. Um, but it would be um, my preference as the architect that it be something that just m matches it exactly and let it blend in like it was always there. That and that, and that, that speaks exactly to, to the issue, I think, that's arising, is that it wasn't always there. And in order to preserve the historic nature of the original structure, Mr. Parker, I'm sorry to cut in before you had a chance to comment, um, but I think that, that in order to preserve the historic nature of the original structure, it can blend in while not matching. And I think that that's what the board is getting at, or at least Mr. Marcus is getting at, and something that I certainly would echo and, and we'll go further into. But Mr. Parker, I want to give you a, a moment. Well, to... I, I, agree with, I agree with Arthur completely because that's generally what we're doing in many of these buildings, to get the identity and the separation between any addition on the property or to the building itself. I think that's we're good. So it's basically... My understanding, I'm not an architect. So this here is primarily then what on a cement slab, is that what that is? This structure? Yes. yes. Yeah. And then is the rest of it going to be surrounded with grass or? Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, um, thank you, Mr. Parker. Um, I think that it's important to be able to do what is necessary to activate the property as a whole, right? And I think that um, to the business owner's point, this certainly will make for a great convenience, uh, you know, to the business and enable you to, to properly service the customers outside. Um, I'm not sure that it's necessary, but I like the idea. And so to that extent, I think we need to find a way to make it acceptable. And taking that a step further, in my opinion, uh, the differentiation is what gets me there, right? I found it problematic that it matched for whatever reason. And usually I'm not one that is too concerned about that kind of thing. But in this instance, because of the placement of it, um, 
the visual aspect from the right of way, even though it is from the railroad tracks across the street. And let's be honest, that road stinks right there. It's really dangerous and not good. And I get that. But nonetheless, it's visible, right? When you drive by, you're going to see it. So I think that it's important that it be differentiated from the original structure so that we can say that building's really old and beautiful. And that's a great idea. It looks good. It, you know, it blends in, but it's not the same. When I'm sitting outside in that courtyard, I want to know that the business put that in there and that that wasn't here since 1914 or whatever this building was formed. You know, and I think that that's really important to preserve the historic nature of the original building. My concern is that without knowing exactly what's going to happen or what that looks like, I don't know how we can vote tonight, right? I mean, isn't that the problem that we're going to run into? Well, we can make a proffer on the record as to stucco, color, and roof tile uh, as a way to distinguish the building. Uh, and we're happy to offer that proffer now. Yep. Uh, and the architect can, can specify uh, something slightly different on the roof, or different on the roof tile. But I would say certainly the stucco can differentiate in color and banding. Right. Yeah, just reiterate. The, the tiles are easy, so I'd, I'd rather do different tiles. Right. The stucco, you know, I wouldn't do the same pattern as we have on the building. So the, it's a unique pattern on the building. I did it myself, actually, trying to match the old one. So we'll do something probably smooth instead. As a contrast. Right, and we may do a little different color on the building. I think those three would be Absolutely. It. I mean, I think that, that would be enough to establish, a, 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 like you said, a contrast, Arthur. I, think that's I would fair also and, think, because I, I just see in this small drawing that is in the staff report, like, you're, match, you're going to great pains, which I commend you, but I thought it was the wrong direction. The column base to match existing, the rough stucco to match existing. So Please talk into the mic. You can make those minor revisions, and I think they are minor architecturally and relatively easy to do. I would agree with your proposal. Of the, uh, so so, so let me, one of the hardest things being historic is that it delays tenants. And it kills leases, and it and I, I'm missing rent, you know, ten thousand a month. So you guys have to approve it before I can submit for permit, Understood. and it's a major problem. It's usually four to seven months to go through this process, then you go apply for a permit. So instead of a six month process, it ends up being a year. So it's, it's a real problem. Yeah, the burdens of, of owning a historic property, certainly. Yeah, I mean, it's, in, in commercial it's buildings, that's why no one... Labor of love, right? A labor of love. With well, it's not true. an investment. <laughs> Ms. Lines, I see that your hand is up. Yes. Um, are you people looking at photographs that I couldn't see in his presentation? Uh, the photographs um, that we were being shown were included in the... Uh, in, in but do the, we have uh, an actual photograph of the proposed structure? No, ma'am. Okay. Would it be appropriate to ask for one? I don't know if they have one. Do you have a, a rendering? We have, the, we have the elevator. I mean, I saw the architectural rendering. The uh, anything other than the architectural rendering? Do we Do we have anything? No. no. Well, they just showed some photos. No, of no, no. That's, she's asking. There isn't. The, the basic shape, to summarize, if I may, yeah. the basic shape will stay the same. The, the barrel tile will be replaced with a cement tile. We'll smooth out the stucco. We'll get plenty of the delineation of the column bases and we'll actually we get rid of the arches okay. so it, the building and you would change the color of the roof and the and the building or so or not. so it'd be a different tile yes yeah, oh, absolutely one. absolutely thank you so um, so trisha let me ask you this question um if the proposal i'm sorry ms lines were you finished i apologize well i just am going to point out one thing sure and that is <clears throat> Staff has not found that any criteria meets the criterion. And that, yeah, that's a problem for me. Yeah, I was, I, I was gonna start getting into that a little bit because I, I also find that problematic in this instance. So Trish, based on the conversation, and let, let me, let me kind of go through these piece by piece in, in my positioning here. The, the first um, subsection, subsection A, that you note does not meet criteria, it, to some extent, it's because it's in front of the historic landmark, and obviously this property is unique in that there is no backyard in which it can be found or back property. I understand that. So clearly, I don't think there's anything we can do if this item were to be approved that would otherwise satisfy that criteria. You'd agree? Um, I would say that there are things to make it better, as you're discussing, right. but to satisfy that part of the criteria, no. Right, because it can't go anywhere else. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. So then if we go to the next 
item. It's the relationship between such work and other structures on the landmark site or other property in the historic district. Um, you know, it's going to vis visually impact it. Your determination that it did not meet criteria in the sense that it would visually impact it is simply because of its placement in front of the property. Is that my understanding? Correct. Majority of the analysis is because of the placement. It is a restricted site, as explained, with the location of the structure on a triangular lot and the way it's shaped and the courtyard that's in front of the, the front facade, which is the only open space on the lot. But um, as you're discussing with the materials under letter F, mm -hmm. um, if materials were changed to differentiate the structure, then that, that assists in meeting that criteria. Um, and then it also talks about the shape of the roof, um, where it does differentiate itself with a different shape of the roof, but at the same time is somewhat problematic because it makes it bigger. Right. <laughs> So, so there's uh, a little there's bit of balance that has yeah. to be found. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then let me try to see if I can summarize your reasoning for, the, for, for uh, your findings um, that doesn't meet criteria. Obviously, the, the materials used we were just discussing, we understand how that would shift based on the proffer. Um, but generally, the other reasons that did not meet the criteria all stem from its location in front of the property. Is that Correct. a fair statement? Yes. Okay. And obviously, on this property, there's nothing we can do about that. So I think Ms. Lyons, initially when I looked at this, I was like, the heck are these people doing here? There's no way, you know, they, they just, it, it is a no. But the more I'm hearing it, the more we're getting into it in the conversation, um, I can tell you that my, I am less troubled by the fact that it didn't meet those criteria because of that general understanding that it all stems from the placement. And I got to tell you, looking at the elevation drawing as well, it doesn't, impede the visualization of the original piece of property to such an extent that I'm troubled by its placement in front, especially in light of the fact that we now have the proffer of it changing materials. So I think that that has possibly changed my uh, my position. I'd be inclined to approve the application. I don't know if, if how you feel about that, Ms. Lyons. Well, I think Tricia's explanation of that is, you know, important. And, but anyway, I think it's really hard to visualize this, and I wish we had a rendering. Yeah, I, th I agree. I think that would certainly be helpful, but... I'm wondering if we could ask you to come back and bring a rendering. Unfortunately, we can't. We actually have to, uh, we have to rule on this today. We have to make a decision on it due to the time frames. Um, but it would certainly be helpful. And for all those who are listening to this meeting in the future, if you do apply renderings and visual or visualizations of proposed it's, renderings... Yeah, it's, well, not just it's so important. Renderings. All right. Um, any other comments from anybody on the board? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Nope. Hearing none. Okay. We're going to go ahead and uh, I would entertain a motion at this time on this item if one were to be made. I'll try a motion. Go for it, Mr. Marcus. Um, motion to approve the resolution for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction. Get into that microphone. For appropriateness for new construction under case number UDP HP 21036 located at 901 Progressive Drive based on the following findings of fact. So we're not referring to any of the staff conditions. Whatever, whatever well, findings I, of I, fact I, that, I, that you believe are appropriate I, I, based on I, I would prefer, I don't, I'm not applying, I'm not referring to any of the staff conditions. The only condition I would like to add is that the applicant has agreed to change the roof tile to differentiate it from the original building, change the building color. He's also said he would like to change the arches and square them off and get rid of some of the detailing like the base that would is not necessary to make it look exactly like the other building. So in the sense that it would then uh, cause for differentiation of the new uh, property or the new building or new structure from the original. And it would still be compatible. Got it. Is there a specification of the roofing material from the board, like such as a flat tile well, rather I, than the barrel tile or? I think the flat, I don't know, what, what, what do you have on the building now? Is it flat concrete tile on the pergola? There is no pergola yet. Right now we're, excuse me, <clears throat> right now we're matching the existing 
but we would change it to a cement tile, uh, a flat cement tile. Okay. Flat cement tile. Different color, same color as the existing? Um, we'd have to study the color because now we're changing the color of the building. Okay. But the point is... But you're changing you know, the type. We're changing the building to look completely different from okay. the existing. Let's go with a flat cement tile, a smooth stucco, and a, uh, and a removal of the arches. Different and different coloration. So I believe that those were the conditions. In addition, uh, Arthur, are you also um, finding, and I'm just asking, not suggesting, but are you also finding that um, there, there, there's a, a finding of fact that there would be no other location on the property in which this pergola could be placed? Yes, uh, I based would. On the I, I would agree. If we want to include that, I think we should, because that explains why we're not approving the other criteria. Agreed. Okay, so that motion being made, is there a second? Yes. Second. <laughs> Seconded by Mr. Parker. He's active today. I, I do that well. I like it. All right, there we go. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, Hearing none, do you want to go ahead and read the resolution? I just had a question first before I read it. Did you want to include the condition that this applicant application is subject to the building zoning and ULDR requirements? I think that was your intent, was it not? I'm sorry, sir. Did you want to include the one condition that's on a page four of the staff report that says this application is public to the approval by building zoning and all ULDR requirements? Of course. Okay. Somebody's like. Who's you? <laughs> we'll go with that. Nice job, Mr. Rosa. Go ahead. <laughs> a resolution of the Historic Preservation Board of the City of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, approving a certificate of appropriateness for new construction for the installation of a one-story pergola patio bar in a courtyard at 901 Progresso Drive, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, case number UDP, HP 21036. All right. The resolution having been read, motion being made and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Ms. Lines is a no. All right, any uh, abstentions? Hearing none, thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. thank you. Good, lu good luck. Have a good evening. Yep. All right, that is going to conclude the business for this evening. That'll bring us to communication. Uh, oh, got one more. Don't oh, we? wait a minute. Uh, you've you been waiting all night. We got somebody waiting online. I'm hey. just teasing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding you. <laughs> That'll bring us item 4.G, certificate of <laughs> For demolition and certificate of appropriateness for major alteration under case number UDPHP 21037, demolition of accessory structure and new one story addition, setback waiver for front yard, setback waiver for rear yard, extension of porch overhang. Applicants are Joaquin and Chelsea Manchego. Uh, address is 419 Southwest 8th Terrace. Uh, let's go for disclosures. Ms. Lyons, any disclosures? Uh, walk by regularly. Walk by regularly. Mr. Rosa? None. Siobhan? None. Mr. Carney? None. I have none. No disclosure. Mr. Marcus, none. And Mr. Parker? There. He walked yes, on I by. I was there. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and hear the staff report. Good evening. Um, this property is located in the Sailboat Bend Historic District. For the, They're requesting the items that the chair has outlined. Uh, this property was Constructed in 1959 and in the most recent architectural resource survey was identified as contributing. Their, their first request, which is for the demolition of the shed structure that is in the um, southwest corner of the lot, is proposed for demolition. That structure was not built at the same time as the, the main house and does not have significance. So staff finds that that does meet the criteria for the request. Um, the second part of the application is a major alteration that has multiple parts. So um, part of it would be a partial demolition, which includes um, a now enclosed carport. And in the photographs, if you're looking at the photographs, let me pull up the photos, actually. Um, it has a wood shingle on the exterior, so it's differentiated from the main house already. And let me just get it to the, the full. Sometimes hard to do multiple duties here. Oops. It's not what are you talking about? You're one person in an entire department. You're <laughs> masterful at doing multiple duties. Yeah. Sure. On the seventh item, I'm still struggling. <laughs> Hold on. This is not working. We have the materials. 
Well, here we go. Do you not need materials? You don't need it? We, we all have them, I believe. Okay. All right. Well, oh. there we go. We'll there just go. share the not full screen. Right. That'll work. Yeah. So as you can see on the front elevation, there is the wood shingles um, to the far left. And that portion of the house would be proposed for demolition. Um, a portion of the main house that, as it exists today would also be demolished, primarily that southern wall and a portion of the roof structure to accommodate the new addition. Um, the new addition will provide additional space for the property owner and provide a master bedroom and um, extension of their kitchen and living room. And there are a few, um, you can see on the, the site plan here where the location of the addition is located, but there are a few issues in regards to our criteria and what is being proposed. Um, you can see where the hatched area ends and um, the new addition extends over. There's a portion of the structure that um, starts to adjust the exterior appearance of the main house in this proposal. So as you can see today on the front elevation, you have the primary entrance that's centered on the main house that exists today. Going left, you have um, a brick inlay that is on the facade. It's painted white, a series of three windows, and then another brick inlay that ultimately frames that front window. Um, in the proposal, the portion to the left of the second inlay would um, be removed. You can also see in the elevation drawing that that um, detail would be removed as well. So you can tell by the elevation drawing that um, the main roof structure, the way it exists today as a hipped roof, would be altered, uh, where the hipped roof on the southern end of the structure, it terminates into a flat wall and then um, the rest of the new addition is constructed. So those adjustments in the front elevation within the proposed new addition are problematic because this is a contributing structure. It does alter, it starts to alter the front elevation. And um, another part of the proposed request is an extension of the front porch and the front overhang. So um, as you can see, overhanging the front entryway as a small overhang, the property owner is proposing to extend that out several feet and then it would be supported by several new columns. Again, altering the front elevation and the front facade. Um, so just to give you a, an idea of the, the problems from staff's point of view and walk you through that, um, relying on the proposal for the new addition are several setback waivers, both on the rear and the front um, facade. This particular site is rather small, so the rear uh, setback waiver is primarily requesting to just align it with what is existing today. It's a it's a shallow yard and then on the front yard it would be similar to where that front elevation that you see that pops out of the enclosed carport lies today as well. It goes a little bit forward I believe than what exists today. Um, so going through the criteria for the request for major alterations it primarily does not meet the, the, um, the criterion, and you'll see that if you look on page five and six of the staff report, and um, it relates back to what I just described as far as what the altered front elevation would ultimately appear as. When you're looking at the material and design guidelines, the proposal uh, does meet the criterion. And then when you're looking at the criteria for approval for the waivers, it doesn't meet the criteria because of the alterations to the front elevation and the alterations to the, the contributing structure itself. Um, with that, staff finds that the application for a certificate of demolition does meet the criteria as, as described earlier. And staff finds that the application for a certificate for major alterations under case number UDP-HP21037 
for the property located at 419 Southwest 8th Terrace does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CI of the ULDR, does not meet the criteria as outlined in section 472411D3CII of the ULDR, and meets the criteria as outlined in section 4717 of the ULDR. Um, there are two conditions that staff proposes if the, the board is to approve this application. One is that all glass shall be clear with an option of low E, and that this application is subject to the approval by building zoning and all ULDR, ULDR requirements. Concerning the setback waivers, again, staff is not finding that it does meet, that it meets the criteria. Um, so with that, that concludes my, my staff report. Thank you very much, Trish. Is there a representative or the applicant present? Right here. All right. Yes, sir. Go ahead and approach the microphone. Uh, put your name on the record and your address. You'll have 15 minutes to address the board. You guys can split up the time if you wish or however you like it. Sounds great. Uh, my name is Joaquin Manchego. I live at 419 um, Southwest 8th Terrace, which is the home in question right here. Um, I really want to thank you guys for hanging out. <laughs> All night, we're all hungry and tired, I can tell I, I am. So if I stumble on some of these words, it's just because my blood sugar is just a tad low right now. Um, really, thank you for seeing me tonight, and thank you for your time. The reason I'm here is to put forth my proposal for my new addition at Southwest 8th Terrace. Do me a Terrace. favor, sir. Get into that microphone. You got it. I've heard you all night. I should know by now. <laughs> we need stronger mics. They're monodirectional. You just got to speak right into the front of it. You'll be fine. So I'm here to convince you to see this project as I see it, to see the potential that I saw in this house seven years ago when I bought it and I moved in. Seven years ago, we were all just coming out of this housing collapse. You know, I, I could have moved into so many neighbors in the neighborhoods in Fort Lauderdale, including you know, Shady Banks, Victoria Park, um, Riverside, just to name a few, and I chose Silbo Bend. Not only Silbo Bend, but I chose this house. Every time I saw another house on my adventures to other places, my mind always came back to 419 Southwest 8th Terrace, or 419 Fort Terrace is what we call it. I, I saw the house and I saw the neighborhood that needed my vision. My lovely wife and I, Chelsea, Chelsea over here, <clears throat> have put so much time, not only into making this a better home, but making it a better neighborhood. Silbo Bend has become a part of who we are, a part of our life, a part of our history, and hopefully a part of our future. When I moved in, nobody told me Silbo Bend was a historically designated or that in seven years it would be more difficult to get things done if you are considered a contributing structure in the neighborhood. The way I see it, there's more than one way to contribute when you live in Selbo Bend. People here are incredible. The parks are increasing in number. Just the enjoyment of being part of a peaceful community and contributing to that is, motivates Chelsea and I to make our home a better place for our family and neighborhood. Now, here in front of us, In front of me, I have the staff report that was put together by the city of Fort Lauderdale, uh, more so by Trisha Logan, and I can't tell you enough, she's a wonderful person. Uh, she's worked very closely with me. I really I do appreciate her time. She has put in a lot of work for this. Um, I, I don't know how many of you guys have tried to go through this certificate of appropriateness. It is not fun for the homeowner. It is very difficult. <clears throat> I've been working on this project since I moved in, but realistically for the past two years, because in the past two years is when I've actually been able to afford this project by refinancing my home. It has taken me years to get the plans just right with the correct mixture of historical preservation and making it a home that my family in Sailboat Bend can be proud of. Now in this staff report, I'd like to address these concerns one at a time to give my explanation and thought process on why we are asking for these considerations and some minor concessions by the, board, by the board. As you look at these plans, please consider how one part works with another 
and how one part cannot function without the other. If I, I'd like to get into the report if that's possible. <clears throat> So starting on page two, uh, which is all the way down at the very bottom, it says alterations that are not appropriate include, and then right into three, removal of one side of the slender tr slump brick detailing, a character defining feature that frames the large front windows. I, I apologize that my architect did not put uh, you know, he, that he, they're not on the plans, but there was no intention of us actually modifying the brick building, uh, that feature. Uh, we've actually, one of the main things that we understand is that the front facade really needs to stay the same. So we understand that. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to the second part of that, which is the bifurcation of the original hipped roof at the junction of where the hipped roof meets a parapet wall, of the rooftop, well, so I'm gonna get into that for a second, but um, it also includes a five foot extension on the existing building. We can and will look at ways to modify the extension of our living room and kitchen, if you so ask of us, maybe by making an extension step out, like so that it looks different from the original building, so it doesn't look like a direct uh, extension of the building. Um, we do not have that on the plans now, but I understand that you want the new construction to look different. So I do understand that. Um, because, this ex uh, because this extension is vital to the remodel in addition that we are proposing, not only does it give us much needed additional room in the kitchen and living room, which right now sits at a total of 506 square feet out of a total 932 square feet for the whole interior of my house. This is livable space. This is all the room that we have in our house. Um, for the whole, so the 932 square feet includes my living area, my dining room, my kitchen, two bedrooms, and two bathrooms. So if you can consider that, that's, it's tiny. Uh, you know, right now, it's in the summertime. You know, you're inside most of the time. It feels very small. We just went through COVID. It's tiny. It, we just couldn't even live in there. We are asking to add a 5 by 24 extension to, at, to the south side, which will increase the interior space by 115 square feet of much needed living and kitchen space for my lovely wife. Um, on, page three, on, on page three, again, to address the hip roof at the junction where it meets the parapet wall and the rooftop terrace, this de design feature is also vital to the project as a whole, not just to be aesthetically appealing to the many people that walk by my house on a daily be basis, but also a smooth transition to the new addition to the south. This change is also vital to the interior and exterior space that we are trying to create. By, by creating this five foot extension inside, we want to raise the in interior of the ceiling height to create a feeling of more space. We want to remove the wall that divides the living room from the kitchen to create an open floor plan in our living area. When it comes to the exterior space, that the small roof change would also affect the the small roof change would also affect the porch extension. As I see it, by not getting the small change in the roof line, it would also not give us room to extend the porch roof to create an outdoor living space. So that leads me right into the porch extension and overhang, which is also on page three. It's, it's down a little bit further. It's in the middle of the page. We are only asking to extend this juncture of the roof by three feet, 10 inches. Um, I have a picture, uh, I, I'd be more than happy to pull it up on how small this looks. Um, if you could help me, my good man. Thank you. Uh, 
Carl, can you guys see that that pulled up? Can we make of course? So if you'll notice, that uh, roof doesn't even cover half or even you know half of my porch. Um, when it rains, that rain just comes down, and we basically cannot sit outside. Um, we and you know when it rains, it rains here very frequently. We have nowhere to go. Our outside space is at a minimum. Right now is the time to be outside. This is the time of year we call it paradise here and why we enjoy living here in Fort Lauderdale. <clears throat> I understand that I'm trying to change the front facade of the house, but you have to understand that my options are limited. The way they subdivided my lot into three separate lots means that I have no backyard. So I have no, I, I literally sit against my neighbors on the backside. Um, my circumstances dictate that I can only move in two directions, east, which is to the front, and to the south, which is hopefully will be the new addition. By limiting these two small changes, the roof bifurcation and the porch extension would all but be changing the whole potential that I saw seven years ago when I moved into this house in Silva Bend. I want to emphasize that in these changes, I'm not trying to change the most architecturally important features of the house. The bay windows in the front are going to stay the same. As I, dis as I discussed before, I will not change the brick detailing that frames these windows. And I think the most important architecturally significant feature of the house will not only stay the same, but will be enhanced by the new addition. And that, of course, are the parapet windows. Let me get those up for you. So if you can see down there, this is what you see as you walk by my house. These are all, you know, these to me are what brought me to the house. Um, I think the most uh, important architecturally centered feature of the house will not only stay the same, but will be enhanced by the new district. And that, of course, is the windows on the north side of the house. This feature is what drew me to the house and is what you see as you pass my house, because it sits on the corner. I'm trying to replicate as much as possible by replicating the look, the size, and the shape on the new addition windows by emphasizing these historical features of the house. The bay windows, the brick feature, and the most prominent feature, the parapet windows. We are minimizing the effects of the changes to the roof and living space and the kitchen extension. As you can see, everything in the new addition and the way it works in concert with the existing house as the plans are laid out, if we disclude one part of these plans and the entire vision, what I've worked for for many years becomes something else entirely. I'm not, hurt, I'm not really sure how my wife and I will be able to get around that. We want to stay here forever and make this house our neighborhood a better place to live, and right now that decision comes down to how you decide on these plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Any members of the public wishing to be heard on this item? Yes. Yes, you can go ahead and approach the lectern, please. State your name and give us your address, and then you'll have two minutes to address the board. And then I know that we have a member online who wants to be heard. But we're going to go live first. Hi, my name is Barbara Peluso, and I'm at 423 Fort Terrace, or 8th Terrace, as they keep saying. Uh, I'm next door neighbor to them, and I just wanted to state that I don't have any objection. I'm directly next door to them on the side that they're going to do the thing. My only request, and it's not a, it's not a demand, it's a, just a request, is that um, I know Broward County has a demolition checklist that they follow, and I am scared to death of critters, so I would really uh, request that they take care of any kind of rat problems before they start doing demolition. Other than that, I have absolutely no problem with what they're doing. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, anybody else in the chambers? Seeing none, let's go online. Okay, we have Ken Farmer who signed up first. Ken, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your video, and then you'll have two minutes uh, to address the board after you give us your name and your address. 
Ken, if you're there, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Ken Farmer. I live at 715 Bryan Place in Sailboat Bend. I fully support the addition and renovation of 419 Southwest 8th Terrace. It is great for the neighborhood to see these owners appreciate Sailboat Bend and want to improve and stay in Sailboat Bend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your comments and the brevity. Uh, do we have anybody else online who wishes to address the board? Yes, we have J.R. Steele. She should be able to unmute herself. All right, go ahead and unmute yourself and turn your camera. And then you will have Great, uh, thank you. to address the board after you state your name and give us your address. Thank you. My name is J.R. Steele. I live at 817 Kunti Court. I am actually kind of a kitty corner uh, to Joaquin and Chelsea. Uh, I can tell you I've been here since 2010, and I saw the house before Joaquin and Chelsea purchased it. And they have made such amazing improvements to the property. Um, they really, when they say that they have contributed to the neighborhood, they have. Um, I find it interesting. And Trish, I know that you know more about historic preservation. I have a historic house. And one of the things I know Joaquin was going through is he had wanted to put a porch on it. And um, my house is older than his and I have this beautiful front porch where I'm able to get out of the rain and I know they don't have like space on the side. So here they're trying to do this. And I know that was one of the feedbacks that they had that they couldn't have the front porch, right? Wasn't that Joaquin? Uh, you couldn't do that front porch. That's, you are correct. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm just like, but look at mine, you know, and I know it's a different style house. It's like, I don't know, it was built 20 years after. I don't know the exact date of your house, but, um, you know, so it just, I, I think that I know that they've worked for a long time. Like, I think it's almost a couple of years at this point to try to do their best by this neighborhood. And I would 100% support the benefit. This is a house that's like, it's really spliced up inside. I remember when it was for sale, going in and looking at it. And it was just, it was like a hodgepodge and they've turned it into a thing of beauty. And I think that if they can make these, it will be um, even better. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to be heard on this item? Anybody else online? No? All right. Hearing none, we're going to go ahead and close public comment. We'll bring it to the board. Let's start with Ms. Lines. Any comments, questions? Okay. Oh, you're muted, Ms. Lines. Sorry, Barbara. No, I, I, I really don't have any questions with it. Okay. Thank you. If anything pops up, just let us know. Ms. Okay. Wilson. I, I realize in the application, I don't think I've ever seen this, but it the material that you guys are using for the, um, I'm going to call it the shell, um, um, it's it's a container. Yeah, it's okay. using containers. And, and the finish of that is going to be a stucco finish? Yes. Okay. Um, and the stucco is going to be varied in any way to what the existing or the remaining, the non-demolished section will be? You'll, you'll, you'll match that or is it going to be varied? Right now the plan is to match it. Okay. We can... We can uh, Anything that kind of gets us through, we are more than happy. No, I, I, I personally find it really intriguing that you're using the metal container fab fabrication. Obviously, the end result will look as if it were CBS or wood, regardless. But actually, safer if you want to. It's like a, it's like a little bunker. Gotcha. I travel for work, so gotcha. Life is going to be there, so I feel very safe with. Adding okay. On. So I guess, I, Trisha, I, I have a question um, regarding. The, the right of way, the front elevation here, are, is it because it's contributing the, in, in regard to why this would not meet criteria? Is that, is that the main kind of meat and potatoes here? Is, is, is all of a sudden because it is contributing on, on the recent survey? Correct. Um, only a portion of what they're proposing is really problematic. It's not the, the primary addition where you see the rooftop terrace. Right. That as a standalone addition, it could be removed in the future. It meets all of the criteria. Okay. Where we get into trouble is um, the connection point between that standalone addition in a way and the alterations that are occurring to the main house. Got it. I think the issue that I see is even if they wanted to accomplish some kind of separation, 
the limitation of the site in, in its size, you know, to some degree kind of makes that very challenging. Is that what you guys have found? It's ex exactly right. We have, right. we have no backyard. Okay. So I, I actually did speak to Trisha about this and if we did have a backyard and we were doing this extension on the backyard, we wouldn't even need to come before this board. Right. But because we do not have a backyard, the front elevation needs to be changed. And so we do have to come in front of this board and try and get a, a certificate of appropriateness. So, so for me, zoning in on that particular reason and, and not as a means of election or subjective purpose, you know, um, it, you really are forced to make this improvement where you've done it. I, I find that compelling enough um, to, to want to lean towards approving it, even though um, I, I understand it's a contributing property. Um, it's tough. You know, you have a very small site, but I, I completely appreciate what you guys are looking to do. I think, I think it looks great. I think the elevations look great. Um, be wonderful. Applaud you for using the shipping container or the container. I think that would be awesome. Um, and and it, it looks great. I, I hope it's something, you, you know, we we can soften towards approving um, because I certainly see the, the validation of why why you'd want it. It makes a lot of sense. I put a lot of work into it, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Rosa. Mr. Parker, anything? Uh <laughs> I, I'm favorable to everything. I think it's, it's one of the things, it's, it's a more generic kind of statement. We are now going in our neighborhood, and I know it's historic, but we're finding we're going into houses now that are built later, and it, it brings a lot of different kind of problems than what we've had previously when you had an historic house. And you're going to see, I think, more variances that we're going to have to consider. And, you know, they, they may not be hitting the more historical nature, but I don't think they're taking away from the, the, the nature of the, the neighborhood itself because they are, many things have been done in order to make them aesthetically fitting in as much as possible with the challenges we have. And we're going to have more of that because there aren't too many more historical homes left to consider, and most of them are going to be in the 80s, 90s, and stuff like this, and it's something we're going to have to, to look at individually very seriously. Thank you. Mr. Marcus. I... Um understand the hardship and that's what it's called you have in terms of the way the lot is configured yeah. and this is the only place for it i typically would not be in favor as staff has said of putting it in the front but i again i don't see any other alternative and yet as we've talked about prior on other projects i am troubled by microphone, I, microphone. I am troubled by the fact that um, the addition, how, how will somebody know, as I've said earlier, how will somebody looking at the house know that this is an addition and this was the original? And, and to that point, I would, you know, point out, I, I see, I'm, I'm more talking about, I guess, the north elevation, which is the front of the house, yes, correct? Sir. Yeah. And the windows, I'm getting confused. This is the existing residence or the new Yes, one? the shaded part is the existing residence. So this is the proposed one. Yes. So my concern is the window the windows look like they're exactly the same. These three windows look similar to what's existing. Yes, sir. And it may be a very simple thing to change the posts inside, change the muntins, change the shape a little bit. You could have a little bit more light in there. Yeah. But I think that would help differentiate it. The window all the way on the right, which is next to the three bay windows in the yeah. um, the large windows in the living room, that seems to be, I guess you're taking out those brick panels. Like I said before, we will not be altering any of the... Well, then, but because then isn't the brick panel where this window would go? I, the brick panel would not extend anywhere close to that window. I will make okay. sure of that. Um, I've discussed this with uh, 
Okay. Tricia, before. So you're going to keep I, the brick I, panels. I will keep everything okay. as much. So I, my, my only same. suggestion, if I don't know if everybody else will agree, is that take a look at these three windows you're adding. Yeah. And also, you're proposing the, um, what's the material? It's going to be stucco. It's going to be stucco, yes, sir. So is it going to be a different stucco? We, I have to ask that question. We can kind of, we can really kind of do it. What, what do you have? It, a, kind of, it would be a very strange transfer, but to, to be quite honest, I've worked on this so hard that I've, I'm willing to can what, give what, concessions to What is the material on the existing house? It is a rough stucco. So this could easily be a smooth stucco. It can easily. It could be a subtle change. Yeah. And then the roof line. I mean, I see that you're just extending the roof, but this is, that's the existing, I keep, I'm sorry. So the roof of the that is proposed a, addition is flat with the The addition is flat, and that is a rooftop terrace. So All right, so I, exactly. That is railing that you're looking so at. So my one other design comment yeah. would be, as much as I really personally love the steel railings and the cable railings, I have to question whether they're appropriate for this type of house in this age. Okay. And that's my only question. Yeah. Um, so our fence that we actually came in front of the historic board um, six years ago for is a vertical three plank fence. And what we were trying to do was kind of match the vertical, uh, I'm sorry, not vertical, horizontal. Where Where is this horizontal fence? Uh, it's in the front. It's It surrounds my whole front yard. Okay. Um, and I it, I don't have a picture of it at, at this moment. Um, I could pull one up very easily. We understand what it is. And I was just trying to, what I was trying to do is just kind of transition everything into a vertical form instead of being oh. a horizontal form. That's what I was I trying to I guess I would take it back because it does show that it's a different material. Yeah. And, and it, so I take back my comment because I think in looking at it, it will stand it out will as an addition stand. very, very well. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, I would urge you to maybe take a look at the windows and see what you might want to do I, with that. To, be, to your point, sir, I was really trying to historically keep those north windows that wrap around because I thought that it would actually enhance the historic uh, But do you, under, do you understand what we're talking I, about I, I, 100%. for all these projects yeah. in terms of in 20 years, what will somebody see? Uh, absolutely. absolutely. I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Mr. Carney. Nothing comment. Thank you so much, Mr. Chabon. Um, I think this family is trying to do the right thing. And uh, I know that uh, some of the other conversations we had about properties there and people living there and maintaining them, uh, this is an example of somebody who wants us to be there and do the right thing. So uh, I don't have the background that Arthur has uh, on architecture and how it should blend. Uh, Richard gave a good explanation of the way he saw it happening and the way it should look. I, I really like the new look of the house. And for them to live there, stay there, and have a quality of life, I think they're just making some changes that make it happen and they'll be there forever. This is wonderful. No complaints. I'm in favor of it. There you go. Thank you. I just have to add one thing that um, sure. as much as we've all talked about this, what staff is saying is correct, that this will change the look of a historic property. So it will not look the same. Yeah, and that's that's kind I of get uh, what, that, if I may, that, that, that was my one of my concerns and what I want to talk to Trish. I want to talk with you for uh, about for a minute here. So the, the demolition meets, you know, meets criteria. I don't think there's any question from anybody on the board about that. So be it. The way that I see it, there are two concerns here. Number one, obviously, the porch extension with the columns. If the columns were not present and there was simply the extension somehow, would that would you find that to be less troublesome from a meeting of the criteria perspective? Not necessarily, because you are altering the front elevation. When you're working in historic preservation, looking at these criteria, Maintaining that appearance, that main front facade, is very important. And by adjusting that outward, it does create an alteration to that front elevation, what the existing design was. Understood. And then the, um, I like the wood paneling. I'm just putting that out there, by the way. I, I guess it's a personal preference. I'm not. I'm not making any suggestions. I just looked at a picture of it. And I'm like, mm, that looks nice. Uh, the uh, the um, 
terrace. Is the terrace itself problematic in that it it change, modifies the appearance of the historical? No. Building? No. Okay. So, in relation to the addition, talk to me about why that is problematic. It's the alteration of, if you're looking at just the main house and the fact that it has a hipped roof and basically they're cutting off a portion of that hipped roof and making it straight into a, the edge of the parapet wall that will serve the new addition, the main new addition. So then you are altering the shape of the roof and you're altering that front elevation because you no longer have a hipped roof. You have half a hipped roof. Hmm. And that creates the issue. And I did talk to um, Joaquin about that the, last week. We had a discussion. Yeah. We but, did have fun. <laughs> yeah. Trisha but, has a lot of discussions. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> she's, she's, yeah she's she's most of my it. day. <laughs> so, all right. I'm troubled here personally, because clearly we have an applicant who wants to do the right thing, right? He wants to stay in this historic property. He wants to come before us, follow the procedures. He wants to stay and, and be a benefit to, to the district, but, but it doesn't meet the criteria. The proposal does not meet the criteria. And as, as much as I feel for you and your desires, and, and it looks good, I don't think it looks bad, it doesn't meet the criteria. And I have said, as this board knows me well enough by now, our job is to look at the four corners of the application, take them and apply them to the code and determine whether or not the application meets the criteria. Um, these aren't necessarily just guidelines either that we're dealing with, right? Like it's not like, well, it should be, you know, a wooden fence with 36 inches, uh, you know, maximum of a 36 inch gap. And we say, well, you know, we'll give it to you 40 inches. Like it's a little bit of a different situation here because the proposal changes the very basis of the historic property. And that is the design, the imagery, the, the appearance. Um, and I don't comment on for the better or worse, but nonetheless, it changes it. Uh, and I'm not sure that this is something that can be as easily fixed as just a different surface like we did with the last item. I just think that that's, that's a little different. And I find that problematic in this regard. I don't know if there's a way for us to get around that. Well, Mr. Chair, I have a question for, yeah. you, for what you're talking about. Sure. Where in the equation you've just laid out, does the applicant's hardship figure? It doesn't. Yeah, but it should. And I think that that's the problem, Shouldn't right? It? Well, it may be so, but we're bound by the code. I and we're, and we're, ba but we're bound by the code to follow the code. We're bound by the four corners of the application. I think that in this instance, it's different, right, than in the, you know, when we're talking about fencing, right? And we're talking about a green vinyl fence versus a wood material. So I'm troubled here because I want to grant this application. I do not believe it is proper to grant it as proposed. And I'm trying to find a way out of it because I want to grant the application. I do. Can I just talk to you real fast about it? And If you have a way, sir, that you can propose to me that you think that your application is going to shift so that it would, it would meet the criterion, I would love to hear it. The only thing that I can tell you... And I, I say that genuinely. I don't say that flippantly. I, I, yeah. The only thing that I can tell you is the way that my house is laid out now. I do not have any other room to make more space for myself. I understand I have, that. I have or, no back... Yeah, but that's... I understand that. I, and I, I noted that when you and when you were presenting earlier. But unfortunately, that doesn't satisfy any and of And when I theory. started this project and when I really put forth a lot of effort there was no such thing as a contributing or a non-contributing uh, house or structure or anything like that. So this, all these plans that I've had have been in my mind forever. I have just only become available to be able to, to afford this kind of structure. So 
you know, if I would have done this a year ago, I, I don't know if I could have done it during COVID time, but if I would have done this three years ago, I, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's only a problem now because of my home, a 1960s home, is a contributing at what, at, at One question, at what point did you realize that this was in a historic district? Because you stated before, when you purchased the home, you're not aware of it. I, I think I learned that about six months in, and okay. I think Mrs. Steele, J.R. Steele, who spoke to us, was the first one to tell us that. Because we've since spoken to the property appraiser who we had here a few years ago, who hopefully has put the historic district label on houses like yours so that it, it shows on the page. And, and to your point, sir, uh, Barbara, who just spoke for us in person here, she just moved in uh, two weeks ago when she bought the house. She didn't even know it was historically until uh, about a week of her living in and, the property. And you know it's the owner, the owner's responsibility. Yeah. 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 So let me, let me just bring, let me bring it back to the, to the application before us for a minute. Um, Is there anything that could be done to allow for the addition, but still allow the roof to remain in its current form? Um, I, I have tried. I, I don't mean to cut off anybody. I, I've tried to look at that, and that's that was the whole point of my presentation was that one thing really makes it so hard to kind of uh, put it into another. You know, if, if we cut out one thing, we're not. It's going to cut out basically the whole thing. Our interior will not look the same. The way that it meets up with the new pair of pits, like on the, um, on the new railing, it, it just, you know, as you go by my house, you'll notice it every time. And it's, my house is one of those houses that- yeah, but I don't know if that's a bad thing, right? That you would notice it every time because but, that's, that's part of the key here, establishing a situation where you could see the historic structure and then the new addition. And I, 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 you know. I can I can understand what you're saying, but if you want people to come through our neighborhood, and I do, and I want people to come through our neighborhood and respect what we're doing, by doing that, I think we're looking at it and saying, well, you're, you know, you guys are just kind of throwing it up there. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to look appropriate. I think it's differentiated in the sense that it's going from the existing roof to now I'm going to call it this flat roof that comes off it. So I to, to, to your point, um, I think you're sort of anti-compatibility in some ways, right, when you're doing this. Right. But the di hearing your difficulty loud and clear, look, agenda item 4D, the first item we'd heard, we literally approved, I think, un not unanimously, Ms. Lyons objected was not in favor, we, we demolished uh, technically a contributing structure. So I exactly. Right, exactly. So, so I think if that's the latitude that we're affording, and, and I think rightfully so, keeping full, full well in play the idea that we're on the four corners of this application, I think this application nails it in terms of the, the compatibility not being there and, and, and really showing the differentiation. I mean, look at the top of this roof. You know, it's got this railing feature that I think totally encompasses what what I what I believe is the ideal to creating an addition. You see that that's an addition. To Arthur's point, maybe if the windows were a little different and all not all matching throughout, that would really take it home. But I, I think in the way that it's showing, at least on its front elevation, it completely does that. Um, that that's my that's my feeling. Talk to me about the porch then for a minute. What, I mean, what are your thoughts about that with the with the pillars and all? Can I? Can I? Show I, you, I hear. I hear you on the addition. Can yeah. I, show you some, I, I hear you. Can I show you some pictures? Well, I, not, not, not right now, sir. Okay. So the the porch, the the part that I'm trying to, you know, I'm looking at page A three. Is that is that the best page to be looking at the porch? Yeah, that's that's what I'm. Right. right so, just so I can understand this better, the the porch almost looks to be existing on being added to the. I can't really visualize it. Is it being added to the existing? Right, that's where it's being Built put into the hit, right. existing hip roof, the new hip yeah. roof. Got it. The existing hip roof. Got it. Got it. So it'll be like a separate little roof that comes it, out. It, yeah, at a different I, at a different slope. At a different slope because of the length of, of the new one. The, we could not continue the see. So that the, and that combined with the pillars, almost to me, right, creates a blocking effect of the existing. And again, take the addition apart. Let's just let's just talk about the porch for a minute. Right. I'm having a tough time vis visualizing. I see it. I see it in the middle of the page there with, with that I was one just angle. At that, yeah. yeah, it's just. 
understand it really. That's how it looks now. Right. I mean, really, it, it, that you can see the, you know, it's, it is a different angle, but you mm-hmm. can actually see the extension when the, on the short eave is what they called it. You can actually see that extending off. This would just kind of change the angle just a slight bit. And you, it, from the front of the house, which would be looking west, you wouldn't even really be able to. I, I was just going to make that point. I think you, I think you nailed it, uh, Mr. Chair. It, if it. if I'm understanding it correctly now, it's sort of looking at. I, I get it now. That's the front, but that's a slider, or is that the back? That's my bedroom uh, door. That will be on the. Richard, uh, what are you looking at? I'm looking at the middle of page A3. Okay. On the, on the left side, the left, the on the shaded the part. Front east elevation. Correct. That'll be, that'll be the door to my bedroom. On okay. The new, on the uh, corrugated shipping container. That would open out onto the new porch? That would open on the new porch, yes, sir. To the rear of the property? No, no, no. That's the front. Okay, then. So that, that would be then the this is Then this is like transposed in the way that I'm looking at it. That's so, what I'm. So you are looking at it from the side. Yeah. The front door would be Got opening it. to the left. Got it. it would be open inside when you'd exit. To the yeah. Left. That would be the porch, the front porch. Okay. You have to walking straight, looking at, again, that front east elevation of the left-hand portion of the drawing. Got it. That would go through a slider into the master bedroom and be into the new addition. Yeah. Okay. That, I think I'm right on. You're, you're absolutely correct. Yes. You got a good eye. I couldn't, tell, I couldn't, I couldn't put, put that all together. It's, it's been late. a long meeting. <laughs> I'm sorry. It would be really helpful if we had... What we do, if we had a front east elevation existing and proposed right next to one another on the same sheet, yeah. Yeah. it would be clearer for everybody to understand. I, I, I get that. I, I do have one of existing. I do not have one of what is proposed. I can yeah, easily well, I, show I, you I both. I think you can see that by the shading, right? The shading is what's existing. The unshaded would be the new. You got, that's how that's differentiated. Well, I'm just here. talking about the one elevation with the existing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Two elevations, anyway. Um. How do I get to the share screen, correct? I, I... Trisha, what was your comment about the porch? I, I'm, I'm just not recalling it exactly. Um, the same kind of the same idea with the roof um, alterations where the addition of the porch, how they're proposing it, does create an alteration to the front elevation. So if you look at what I'm putting up now, this is... My view, I, I had to kind of fold a piece of paper together. I wanted to bring you in of what it would look like with the hip still being there and how it would just kind of change the front porch and it would just kind of look strange coming straight into the uh, addition that we're requesting. So if you can look at it, you can see that it would just kind of go into the side and it just wouldn't even come close to looking the same. And it would take away our front porch that we are requesting. And then you have over here. Uh, it, would, it would shrink it, right? It would make it, it would make the need to have a smaller front porch. The whole idea being the eve that was off it initially was sort of crashing water, right, as you guys were stepping out. You know, the, the interesting part is if you do, do go to the Sailboat Bend design guidelines, they're very big on front porches. That's a part that's there. So they it, it's articulated, it's codified, it's there. So... You know, there's, it's a hard one, but there's there's very much um, points that are in the sailboat bend design guidelines that that emphasize it. I think that, that want it there. Um, I had a tough time visually at first, but now that I think I'm there, that would, that would be the one swaying factor, I think, in this case. This, and this picture looks directly west at my front porch. You pretty much wouldn't even be able to tell the the angle difference of that new roof. So how farther out would that be coming from the existing? That would be coming, so you see the tree there to yeah. your right? It would come up to the end of that tree. It would be three feet, three feet, ten inches. Got it. All right. I think this horse is dead and we've beaten it. <laughs> um, I'll entertain a motion if there is one to be made. Hmm. Well, can I just make a comment? Yeah, please, please. I mean, we, we throughout the course of the evening, we had a lot of discussion about different things. And one of the things that came up was, uh, Richard, you had asked Tricia about how much of a difference there is in the historical percentage of a 
property when it's altered or fixed up or repaired. Um, are we, or Jason, I'm asking you then, are you taken back by the historic image of this property after the alter after he makes these changes is that your biggest concern that it, it will no longer fit the definition so to speak or we've taken too much of its historic meat away yeah, from the I bone think, yeah i think that to some ex extent that is a concern of mine especially in light of the fact that if we're trying to uh shave off this square peg to fit it into the round hole which we often do right we try to, right. We try to work as best we can my concern is that this might be a step too far um, in the sense that it, it it either removes or hides the historic nature of the building to such an extent that what next? And but I it, rare, that's rarely an argument that I make, right? Right. Um, but if we were to agree that the roof line differentiates the addition from the rest of the house, uh, which was Richard's uh, proposal, mm -hmm. then the only thing we're really talking about is how does this guy put his porch in yeah. and make that look different from the rest of the house, but still be complementary and, and, but I'm not and so blend concerned. with the yeah. existing structure. My concern is not that it looks so different, because I think that it, it may, in the way that it's proposed, my concern is that it impedes the, vis the visualization, the view of the current historic structure. I think that I'm less concerned about the addition because it's so noticeably different. I'm probably, you know, I'm troubled by the roof line. I got to be honest, I kind of think I like the idea of having the, the angled roof line come down, but I understand the problems there, but nonetheless. That's just a personal opinion. But the porch, I actually, and I don't know why, but I'm finding the porch to be most problematic for me, right? So, it's most troubling. I think there's one point of clarification that's worth making because I went back to BCPA and looked at the actual effective date of build. This house goes back to 1960, 1959. I know it's in the contributing survey. But Tricia, prior to the survey, what was the threshold? What was the year that we always used as a point of, uh, as a point of, as a starting point to when we would, prior to the survey, think, think the structure would be historic? Well, the original sailboat bend study described properties that were built 1940 and prior, right. but also had a caveat that talked about properties built in the 1940s and 50s right. as also being compatible and contributing to the district. So it wasn't right. a clear definition, which sure. is why the survey was helpful. So I think I bring that up only in this case because of how much I think we're teetering on that, that fine line. And if you take the survey away for a moment, it does go back to 1940. It reaches into 1950. And here we have an effective date of 1960. Mm. So, uh, for, you know, if this was a 1940 house, sure, you know, there's, there's certainly those points. But arguably pre-survey, um, this is not a historic home. I disagree. Okay. Because the criteria is 50 years. Right. It's a shifting, it's a shifting line. Right. right, it's a shifting line. And that's the problem is as we go forward. So I, I have a, I'm looking at your concern about the porch. And I have a suggestion. I don't know if it'll be something that will fly. It's 9 o'clock. We're still going. We're having a conversation. No, we're almost so done. Let's see what we can do. <laughs> I mean, you. I think it looks like you've tried to make the porch look very compatible with the existing residents. Absolutely. Your eyes in terms of the yeah. roof line and everything. I like the idea that you what you've done with the new addition. Hopefully, you'll look at the windows again. Mm -hmm. um, but what if you were to make this porch roof something that were perhaps more a little bit more contemporary and much more invisible? I mean, I'm sure there are ways that your architect could do that, and maybe not as our chair is saying, maybe not with the columns, but something that looks like gives you the protection you want, but at the same time doesn't stick out like, hi, I'm a new addition. What about an awning? Pardon? What about an awning? I've, I've uh, looked at an awning, but that's still to your concern. That's still covering uh, the historic parts of the house. Well, I, I know it will, but I'm just saying I think, anyway. I think your architect could look at something that is yeah. less obtrusive. Yes, and I, to your point, sir, on the end, I, I have thought about it on it, and it, it, I, that's why it's not there now, is because it, would, it just does not look, it, it would not go correctly with what I want to do. And to, you know, along those lines, that's why I was going to say, what if we could 
build that out, that coverage out without the pillars. Right. Well, that's why I, I was yeah. glad that Arthur chimed in because I was going to suggest we ask the architect on our board, how do you, and you used the exact word I was going to look for, how do we make that uh, structure invisible? How do we make that por exactly. the porch yeah. coverage invisible? You were concerned about the, the uh, columns. columns. What if they were just poles? What if they were just well, something what if, what that was the more contemporary and just without a column distinct distinctively different from the rest of the home and invisible um, and that's that's my suggestion i don't know how to do that i don't either but the architect can look at that deep yeah so where are we at with all this mr chair well we're waiting on a motion we're nowhere yeah we're nowhere uh i think i've voiced all of my concerns we've had, definitely had a, a robust conversation on this uh, but I wouldn't entertain a motion if, if anybody wishes to make one. We we need a motion of some sort on this. I would and, and I would just note, I, I would like to make a motion. I, I would note before the motion's I, made. Hang on. Go ahead. There are multiple. Are you, there are multiple uh, applications. So when the motion is made, please. It, do we need to take separate motions on this for each piece, or can we do a motion? You can do it all in one. I can uh, read the resolution for you, and just you could just say I approve the resolution. Okay, so then go ahead and when, well, you, when you make the motion, let's do it to address all issues: the demolition, the the alteration. Uh, before I read it, uh, did you want to include the staff conditions in the staff report, which are on um, page eight, which says all glass must be clear with an option of low E. Yeah. This application is subject to approval by building zoning. LDR requirements that's that one is for the major alteration and then for the demolition that's on page seven of the staff report it states the demolition of the structure shall not negatively impact the adjacent historic district and protection from construction debris and construction equipment shall be provided as necessary this application is subject to the approval by building zoning and all ULDR requirements yes and make sure to voice whatever findings of fact you specifically make because the okay. And Mr. Chair, if, if uh, the maker of the motion will accept, I have some additions as we've talked about, if, if he chooses to do that in terms of just what we've talked about, taking a look at the windows, making them a little different so they're not the same as the existing house. I can definitely. And I think do that. that will enhance your whole house. We'll definitely do that. And secondly, having your architect take a look at the roof covering, possibly without columns, but something that is far less obtrusive, it Absol would not be seen. Absolutely, I, I, I don't mind that at all. That gives me more. All right, Mr. Rosa, if, uh, if you want to go ahead and make your motion. Yeah, I'm just delicately trying to find that exact um, part of the criterion here in which we would um, move move against staff's recommendation. Um, this part I didn't see, not to bring up a whole new issue, but that there were prior alterations even before we got here, which is interesting. Um, I would I would lean on the board to to chime in and and I'll certainly I, I think I have an idea here on what we're going to do but as to the criteria and I you know trying to find that real precise reason right. in this case which is probably the toughest one of the night acknowledging that it, it is it definitely is um, I think it's cost of the hour that's fair that's totally fair um, all right let's take a shot here. So we're combining everything. We're not doing a separate demo. We're not doing a separate. Uh, I could read the title of the resolution, and you could just say I approve the resolution, and then um, whatever finding of facts. I know you mentioned that there's no backyard and whatever else. Perfect. So. That works. A resolution of the Historic Preservation Board of the City of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, approving a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition of a shed, certificate of appropriateness for major alterations for a new addition, which includes the addition of a master bedroom, bathroom, extension of the kitchen and living room, and a rooftop terrace, and setback waivers for the front yard and rear yard for the property located at 419 Southwest 8 Terrace, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, case number UDP HP 21037. With the findings of fact uh, based upon the small or limited site size and the availability of locating an addition elsewhere or otherwise from what is currently shown on the application. And virtually, if you would, I, I, it's Arthur. I think the word hardship is important to add somewhere in your resolution because this is the reason why we're overruling staff's recommendations. I would be fine with that. I, I don't know if that's... Well, I think the, the property creates a hardship. Okay. 
That's not in the criteria, but if you want me to add it, I can add it. I, I would be okay adding it. All right. Motion. Can I make a clarification on Please. a couple other things that were discussed? Um, did you want to include the use of smooth stucco on the addition? Yeah, I think that the intent would be for the alteration or the, the modifications that were discussed for smooth stucco, uh, the, the differentiation in the windows on the addition. Um, are we doing a differentiation in the windows? Because the windows are currently shown to be in the same schedule as the existing. I think that was discussed with yeah, the applicant. We, the applicant was okay with that. Okay. Yeah, that the, the, there will be some sort of differentiation with the windows. Sure. We'll include that and, as well. And retaining the slump brick detail yes. that frame the front windows. Right, the and brick, the brick. Okay. exploration of an alternative roof covering of the porch overhang. Yeah. Without columns. Without columns. Exploring options. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we're going to go. It's a little slippery. Yeah. Um, I think we might. Sit, structurally, we don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's a tough one. We give them. A, we're handing out an assignment. I, I don't really know what the object objective. I, I think is. the recommendation has been made. Right. How about the, how about okay. less obtrusive I, columns? And Again, I don't know how we would accomplish that or us. Well, I think that I I think that the uh, the implication has been made. It's understood. I don't okay. Think it's part of the motion. Sure. So if we can consolidate that um, into the resolution, that would be great. All right. So a motion to approve the resolution, subject to the uh, conditions that were previously stated and the findings of fact, as outlined by Mr. Rosa. Is there a second to his motion? Second. Seconded by Mr. Marcus. Any discussion on the motion? You sure. Nobody? Okay. Nobody? <laughs> all right. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. Any abstentions? All right. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good luck. All right. The motion carries. That concludes the formal business of the evening. We do have communication to the city. Uh, we have the communications that we previously sent up, I think, are being considered tomorrow uh, by the commission. Correct. So that's wonderful. They will hear how amazing Trish is and how she needs more help. Uh, and that'll bring us to the For the Good of the City update on historic preservation ordinance and material discussion. Yeah, I'll make it quick this time. But um, a couple of meetings ago, Barbara was tasked with meeting with me to discuss some of the, the things that regularly come up in our discussions and our items that come before the board. Uh, we did talk about the sailboat bend material and design guidelines being updated. It was something that came before the boards probably about a year ago and then multiple other times, but we put a pause on it to meet with the, the neighborhood and we just haven't been able to get back to address some of the comments that the neighborhood and I had discussed. So that will be forthcoming, which will address. Hold it to the next agenda. Yeah. All right. Which we will address eventually. <laughs> but we'd also discuss um, doing some, some overviews of some of our regulations. But I'll try to find an opportunity when we have a lighter agenda to place that on there so that we can have a further discussion. But I just wanted to provide an update of what our discussion was. We didn't forget about it. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. All right, Mr. so Chair, that's going to, yeah. I have one more issue. Yeah, please. Oh, uh, are you talking about, I'm talking about this? I'm, I don't my, know. My one question is, refers back to the three. Get into that microphone, designation, Those three historic designations we discussed earlier in the meeting. Since, obviously, the Times Square is going to be delayed a little bit because we want to do further discussion, and the Bayview building also, because we don't want to interfere with their construction, I originally proposed 10 buildings, which we cut down to three because staff did not have the staff to do that. My question is, can we go back and propose some other buildings? I have to ask that question. Uh, you, you can if you want. You can add, you know, you can ask us to put whatever you'd like on the agenda. The only... The real clarification that I'm searching for is to whether or not the board wishes to do a district for that particular plaza or a um, in each landmark because right. yeah, for, well, for we, the, la the definition of a landmark is one property. To so that to that end, one I'm, I'm speaking also tomorrow, Tricia, the board asked me at the commission because the, our communication involves the creation 
uh, changing the zoning and creation of a thematic historic district, which is what is needed before we can unite. On but that's different from Times Square. And that's the key is that the Times Square oh. Plaza is not uh, disjointed. It's not, it's contig it's a contiguous different, different owners. multi unit property with different owners, right? So what I think that we need to figure out is if we are going to consider that, we either have to have it be a, we have to um, apply to institute a new historic district for that corner, much like they have down in somebody else's property, um, or, you know, that little, little street, or uh, we need to have multiple landmark designations for each owner who owns two or three units and say, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one. And that's, that's what we need to figure out. And I go back to the fact that if we start to break up individual units, it's totally detrimental to the idea that this is an urban design project. Right. And so not an architecture. Project. That's why, and I don't, is it different units because of the way it was plotted or the way it was, I mean, uh, we'd have to further research that, but there's separate legal descriptions, separate separate owners. There's multiple right. owners, and so the someone con someone condoed it. I'm sorry to cut you off. I, I would I would think. Yeah, right. Well, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, Barbara. I wanted to ask about that property that um, that we discussed at the beginning, and that is: are all the buildings within that section, within that group, or are they all his? Do they all fall into the category of being historic properties? Hmm. We don't know. It was built as one entity. Well, we don't. I think, we think the other, I think the other thing is we don't know because we uh, we wouldn't find out until we until Trish had the opportunity to, to do the research right. to see if it qualified. In other words, in other words, we don't know. Certain things have changed at this point. Right. But if you wish for us to, you know, notice it as a district, then you. Just let us know. That's really what I'm searching for, some guidance oh. on that. Because there's a there's different there's different uh essentially a different procedure for a district. It'll come here first and then it goes to the planning and zoning board and then it goes to the city commission. And there's a little bit more work for a district versus individual applications. So I, we just wanted clarification on I that. I appreciate what you're saying, but I think it would be also helpful to get a sense of where the city commission is. Because if they are leaning towards a thematic district where we could unite all of McCurahan's buildings, might that be another solution? I mean, I don't know which is the best way to go. That's I don't know either. We all have to. So I think that then, then maybe that's maybe tomorrow's conversation with the commission could be somewhat guiding on our conversation on this in the next agenda when we bring it up at the end of the agenda. So let's let's continue this next meeting, um, and kind of see what happens when you go before the commission tomorrow. That, that'll be a good next step. Did you want say, us to place it on the agenda though, as just right in their landmark or district? That way, there's proper notice. I would prefer that since it's finally gotten on the agenda after being in good and welfare, I'd like to see it stay on the agenda if possible. I don't want to do that as an item because I don't want to be forced in the same situation as we were tonight where we need to get more information. We have more questions. We want oh. more answers. And then all of a sudden we have to deal with pulling it off and I don't want them to bring their lawyers out and have to pay them. That's too much. I think if we if we put it on the agenda on the for the good of the city so that it, we know it's something we're going to talk about, let's have the conversation about how the commission deals with it, figure out the best way to go forward, and then we can address it. I think that's what you had voted for to put it on for the good of, but did you want us to put... Uh, no. District in there nope. at all? I want okay. you just just to, making yeah. sure. Time throw it in there. Session. It's just okay. a conversation. We'll figure okay. it out from there. Okay. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Anybody moving to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Thank you so much. Be adjourned at nine eighteen p.m. Only nine. Oh. Holy shit! Hallelujah.